When I started this journey, I thought it would be a fun challenge to try to rebuild a functional society in a world overrun by zombies. The odds were not in my favor as I started off underweight, unfit, deprived, and with a broken leg. But with a bit of luck, a solid crew, and thousands of rounds of ammunition, I was able to stake my claim to the wasteland. Welcome to 300 Days of Zomboid, the movie. On the start of day one, I awoke with only three things. My underwear, the splint on my leg, and my go-getter attitude. I began my journey by first limping to the kitchen to search for food and water. And despite not having any pockets, I was able to stash a few cans of food, assuming I'd soon find a can opener. I was wrong. While still in the kitchen, I was fortunate enough to find my first weapon. After securing some food and a weapon, I began to search the rest of the house for other useful items. One of which was the Electricity for Dummies book, which I decided to enjoy before taking a stroll outside. Soon after leaving the house, I was greeted by my first neighborhood zombie. A lone wanderer with something that I desperately needed. Clothes. So, I showed off my baking skills and got myself equipped. A few steps later, and I found a zombie that was holding a duffel bag. This is probably one of the greatest starts I've had to Project Zomboid. You know, despite the broken leg. With my new bag, I began limping along towards another nearby house and spotted a single zombie knocking on the window. So, I went to dispose of it when... Oh no, no no. No, 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 no. I knew I could handle a few zombies if they came in a line, but as soon as all these other ones showed up, I knew that I had to run for it. Luckily, despite having a broken leg, I could still hop short fences, and so I hopped a few fences and made my way into the woods. And once again, I was back on the hunt for a can opener. This hunt went on for a while. I went house to house finding magazines and beginner books, but no can opener. Luckily, however, in my search, I did find a crowbar. And with the new weapon came new confidence in being able to dispatch of the undead. Unfortunately, at the end of day one, I still wasn't able to find my can opener, but I was able to find a food source that was bagged rather than canned and therefore was finally able to eat. A short-term victory for sure, but one that would see us through to day two. When I awoke the next morning, it was pretty early, so rather than fumble about in the dark, I decided to use this time to read some of those books I found on day one. This was actually also the first time I took a look at my skill menu to witness the gravity of my decisions during character creation. My fitness level wasn't even level one, and this was going to be something that I would have to work on for the rest of the playthrough. Despite this realization, I once again had to look at the task at hand, which was finding a can opener. So I walked to the neighboring house and was once again disappointed in the preparedness of these homeowners. On the way out of that house, I bumped into my first survivor, Steven. I had some skepticism about recruiting survivors early on. I didn't want them to pull zombies when I couldn't handle them, but with a level zero in fitness and a broken leg, I feel like Steven is probably going to help more than hurt. Oh, Steven, no. We cannot fight that many zombies. Oh, they are coming right for us. Yeah, I'd be freaking out too. All right, you lead those guys over there. I'll take on these two. Oh my gosh, this dude is a giga chad with that bat. I was starting to feel pretty good about my situation now. With my brains and Steven's bronze, we take the fight straight to the... Oh, oh, no, no, no. Ugh, just a scratch, Steven. Okay, maybe I got a little too confident, but I did find Steven this beret. Moving on. We dispatched of a few more zombies in the local area and then decided to hit up the grocery store and lived every kid's dream by having chips, soda, and candy for lunch. After that, we headed to the department store next door, cleared out a few zombies, found a roadside duffel bag with a bunch of useful goodies in it, and got ourselves some new clothes. After all the looting that Steven and I had done, the sun started to go down, and so we went back to one of the houses we had already looted, and like the best friends we were turning out to be, Steven and I slept in some bunk beds. The next morning was pretty uneventful. Steven and I checked out a few cars to see if they might have gas, but no such luck. We looted the local bar, fought off a few more zombies, but without a proper base, we were running out of inventory space fast. 
it looked like day three was going to be a wash. That is, until we met Matthew. With Matthew on board, our duo was now a trio, and our odds of survivability increased even more. Since we went to bed pretty early on on day three, thanks to our visit to the local tavern, we also woke up super early. And not only was it dark, it was also raining. Despite the storm, we continued our sweep of the neighborhood and it finally happened. We found our can opener. So next on the list was to find a working car, which again was gonna be something a little more difficult than I had originally anticipated. We went to the local gas station to clear it out and met our third survivor, Jake. Now we had a proper squad. Next, we fought off some Zeds outside the police station. The station had lots of goodies for us, but I felt we weren't really ready to go loud, as it were. So we just got ourselves outfitted in armor and would come back for the rest later. On day five, we went around checking vehicles and stumbled upon a gas can. Unfortunately, however, I didn't realize we wouldn't be able to use it to pump gas until we plug in a generator and had already siphoned gas from a car to start the generator. With that in mind, I started searching for fuel, and since I was checking cars anyway, I decided to also level up my mechanic skill. Everything was going great until freaking Tyler showed up with his entourage of undead. We managed to take out the zombies, but for the ambush, Tyler was not allowed to hang out with us. At the end of day 5, we weren't able to find any gas, but we did level up in mechanics, and so that's a win. Day 6 started just like any other day. Worked a little on mechanics, and then we decided to head over to check out a nearby house. But we couldn't have known how many zombies would be there waiting. We did the best that we could, but during the fray we got separated. And Jake got bit. Jake helped us clear the rest of the area. We even found a car that had some gas. We siphoned what little it had and then had to have a discussion. Jake was a danger to us all and we had to go our separate ways. Jake got angry at this and started attacking us. We had to fight back. And now a man we once called friend lies lifeless on the ground. Our hearts were heavy, but our gas cans were full. So we continued with the mission. We needed to find a generator. While we were searching, we found a car that was in pretty good condition. But even better than that, it also had a key. At the end of day six, and with the discovery of the key, we now had two goals. Find a generator and find a battery with some charge. On the start of day seven, I was inspired by some gym equipment I found in a garage. So I decided to start doing some squats. And to be honest, I probably should have started doing this on day one. After my morning workout, we went back to the parking lot that Tyler ambushed us at and worked some more on my mechanics. Later, I decided to offload some of my cargo into that car I found earlier and realized that my roadside duffel bag actually had a car battery charger in it. So gas, check. Battery, check. Now all we needed to do was find that generator. We searched some nearby houses and made a new friend, Lorna. We spent the rest of the day looking for a generator. But unfortunately, by the end of day seven, we weren't able to find one. On day eight, I woke up nice and early and got started with a workout. The task for today, just like yesterday, was to hunt for a generator. But unlike yesterday, today we actually found one. And in the process, found another friend. Finding the generator put all other plans in motion. We hooked up the generator at the house, charged the battery for the car, we did have to leave Lorna on guard because we only had four seats in the car, but then we took the working vehicle to the gas station, filled the car and two gas cans full of fuel, and then finally drove down to the park in the gated community where I had always planned on building our colony. When we arrived at the park, there was already a group of survivors fighting off some zombies, so we invited them to join us, increasing our numbers to eight. All in all, today was a good day. Day 9 started with me leading an early morning fitness class in my bedroom, before heading over to the park to start assigning jobs. For now, I just wanted everyone on guard duty, except for Steven and Matthew of course, those guys are my ride or die. I was setting up my work zones when this dude Gillian showed up with a horde behind him just blasting away with his rifle, letting literally the whole neighborhood of zombies know right where we were. Luckily we had a whole crew so it wasn't too bad to dispose of them. But that was a real Tyler move, Gillian. Steven, Matthew, and I spent the rest of the day dismantling furniture to get enough materials to wall off this entrance while I had Martin moving zombie corpses out of the base area. On the morning of day 10, it was time for some squats. Later, I bumped into Gillian again, and despite his unfortunate entrance yesterday, I figured his rifle might be helpful later, so I invited him into the clan. 
With Gillian now in tow, Matthew, Steven, and I went to clear out any additional zombies that might be lurking around near our settlement, and in the process met Sam and Dean. Having six people with me would draw too much attention, so I decided to leave everyone at the base with Steven in charge and took Matthew with me on a mission to pick up Lorna. However, plans changed real quick once we heard the helicopter. In a panic, Matthew and I booked it to a farm a decent way away from our base. We had hoped that we could lead the zombies away from the others. At the farmhouse, we met Claire. We didn't really need more people at this point, but right now it was just me and Matthew, and Claire had something we needed, an ax. On day 11, we took Claire back to the base and introduced her to everybody, and set her to work chopping trees in the park. Meanwhile, I grabbed Matthew and Gillian, and we loaded up in the car to head over to a warehouse outside of town. We were able to find tools, boxes of nails, and seeds. Everything we needed to start building our new home. I had several long commutes during the day, and so most of the day was spent driving all over town. Day 12 started with my usual workout, and then I spent the whole day sawing logs and laying the foundation for our first building. I kept trying to fix this grass poking out right here, but nothing worked. Much to my rage, this little grass patch also survived 100 days in Project Zomboid. I think by this point we can just assume that my morning routine involves doing squats. It's day 13 and it's time to work some more on our first building. But first, on my way over, I saw this dude named Benjamin that was fully outfitted in military garb and thought, why not? I once again spent the day sawing logs gathered by my friends and started working on the walls for our base. I got the brick walls done and then I realized if I didn't want to just have a brick box, I wanted to do something different with the front. So I decided to add glass walls to the front instead. On day 14, I worked on finishing the front of the building by adding glass doors and a concrete walkway to the front. I had taken some damage from being over encumbered, so I took a look at my health menu and I realized that today marked two weeks that my leg had been in a splint. And I seemed to be walking just fine. So I decided to take a risk and take off the splint to see what happened. And it turns out I was good. Next up was the ceiling, but I realized that I wasn't high enough level in carpentry yet to build stairs. Luckily though, after sawing all those logs, I was pretty dang close. And I had a lot of logs left over to work on. Once I reached level 6, I plopped down some stairs and started setting up the roof. But then something truly terrible happened. I'm not gonna lie, my heart dropped at that moment because I thought for sure I had broken my leg again. After that fall, I took a break for the rest of the day from roof construction, and instead set up a farming plot for the citizens to tend to. Okay, so unfortunately I don't have footage for day 15. As much as I would like to say it's for some technical reason, in truth it's just because I forgot to start the recording. So to summarize day 15, I finished the roof and I moved a bed from a local house into the building that we made. Day 16 went by pretty quickly. I set everyone to either chop or stockpile wood while I worked on making a roofed area over our stairwell. I also added some additional storage crates to clear up space in my inventory. While sorting through my inventory though, I did notice that we were running a little low on food. On day 17, I grabbed my boy Matthew and that other guy Gillian, and we went on a looting run looking to stock up on food for the base. After grabbing some canned goods, we went home and decided to hook up the generator on the roof. We finished the day off by sawing some more logs and building a railing around the roof to prevent what happened the other day from happening again. Today, I also decided that I was going to start doing squats twice a day, once in the morning and once before bed, just so that way I could get a little bit further along in my fitness. Day 18 was spent working around the base. I decided I wanted to make a nice little parking lot for the car. And then I also thought it might look a little nicer if I pulled some of the weeds around the base. This took quite a long time, but I think overall it looked a lot better. After cleaning up a little bit of the base on day 18, I decided that I really liked the look of a clean lawn, so I decided to do some landscaping. I cleared the weeds in the garden and put down a walkway around it. I then spent a good amount of time mowing the lawn by hand, but I was happy with the result. After that, I decided to take Matthew and Gillian out again to get more supplies from that warehouse we hit up earlier. A zombie strolled in while I was looting, and it looked like Matthew and Gillian would handle it when... Guys, what are you doing? Fight back! Oh, you idiots. Gillian was bit. 
Matthew luckily only had a scratch. Once again, my heart was heavy, but I learned my lesson from the loss of our friend Jake that kicking Gillian out now would not go smoothly. So I decided to take Gillian back to the base so he could live his final hours surrounded by his friends. Also, as a side note, I bet some of you were wondering what happened to the glass on the front of my building. With the 10 years later mod, if you build something, leave the local area and come back, it assumes it's been 10 years, hence the hanging gardens that grew on my roof in a day. The first thing I did on day 20 was take some time to clear off the roof. Then I unloaded the car from yesterday's run and decided it was time to start putting in some proper infrastructure, starting with a rain collector. Unfortunately, however, I was not high enough level yet to make the nice one. I thought it would be a good idea to go exploring in hopes of finding some skill books. But before I left, I thought it might be a good idea to take away that rifle from Gillian, just in case he went feral while we were gone. It was just Matthew and I on the road again. While we were out, we found this large tank of some kind parked in the middle of this parking lot. We got out of the car to check it out, but we soon realized that there were too many zombies. I hopped back in the car, but Matthew panicked and wouldn't get in. Matthew, run! He almost made it out, but at the last second... Oh no! Matthew was one of my oldest friends, and now he was gone. And I did not take his death lightly. In my rage, I went straight to the police station and geared up for a fight. I spent the rest of the evening taking my anger out on as many zombies as my shotgun could pierce. More and more zombies fell, but no amount of zombie death could quench my rage. I didn't get home until after midnight. I didn't have the heart to tell Steven what had happened, but he knew. I went to bed on day 20, a broken man. On day 21, I decided we needed to retrieve Matthew's body. I needed a crew for this, so I went to Gillian. He was Matthew's friend after all, and on death's door himself. I went to give him his rifle back and check on his bite, but there was no bite to be found. Fate had marked Gillian for death, but settled on taking Matthew instead. As the eldest member of the community, I also invited Steven as well. We left the car behind and walked our way to Matthew, clearing every undead we saw along the way. We managed to bring his body home and left him here as a reminder of my failure. On day 22, I thought it would be a good idea to add Benjamin to our hit squad, and we set out to clear some of the areas nearby. My thought process is, if we would have done this earlier, we would still have Matthew with us. On day 23, I decided that I wanted to start looting some of the shops in town. We still had quite a few zombies around though, so I tried to use the car to lure as many zombies as I could out of certain zones. I was able to pull a pretty good number out of town to the north, but when I came back down to check out the hardware store... Oh crap, no. Oh, come on. Uh, oh, come on, no. Oh my gosh, I can't believe my car just died right there. Oh, that was very scary. Needless to say, I spent the rest of the day slowly making my way back to the base on foot. On day 24, I was on the hunt for a new car. There were a few problems though. I wasn't high enough level yet to hotwire vehicles, and I left the gas cans that I had in the back of my old car. So I first searched for a new gas can, and luckily was able to find one in a garage nearby. I then started investigating some of the cars in the area and hit the jackpot. Another car with a key. It looked like this was going to be my new vehicle, so I went back to the parking lot just outside of town to look for a car that had a little bit of gas in it. I siphoned some fuel, and I was so pumped to have a working vehicle again. Until I realized, I think I left the car battery charger in the car too. <sighs> this led me to one conclusion. We were going to have to siege the city and get our stuff back. So I spent the rest of the day getting everyone geared up for our assault tomorrow. 
Day 25 was the day of reckoning. We had a squad assembled and a mission. We walked down the main street of Riverside to slowly make our way back to the car. We would form up and hold a position to draw the zombies out in the area, and then we just unloaded on them. This happened over and over again, and I'm not gonna lie, this was extremely satisfying. I felt like a cowboy at high noon. This went on literally all day, until we finally made it back to the broken car and got what we needed. <sighs> I, mm, I forgot to press record at the beginning of the day. Not a lot happened. I mean, I did get the car, but w all of the stuff to building up to getting the car happened already. I just went and put the battery in. So I had also grabbed a refrigerator, so that way we could store our produce, as well as a cabinet to later install a sink. I still wasn't a good enough carpenter to make a large rain collector, but with a storm like this, I figured I should put something down. I made sure to put it above where the sink was going to go so I could pipe it up later. On day 27, I woke up and I stole a sink. I then installed it on my countertop, but then I realized I couldn't plumb it because I didn't have a pipe wrench. So I got in my car and headed over to my local tool store. While there, I grabbed some standing lights for the base and procured a pipe wrench. When I got home, I hooked up the sink and I decided to wash myself, I think for the first time ever. I then decided to do some squats and... Fitness level two. So for some reason, my sleep schedule had gotten super weird where I was waking up really early and getting tired by like four in the afternoon. So I just chilled the rest of the day to try to get it back to normal. Day 28, I went to the bookstore to get my learning on. I read some magazines and grabbed a bunch of books so I could start leveling up my skills. I then went back to that old parking lot and worked on leveling up my mechanics. I really wanted this Mustang and all I needed was one more level in order to hotwire it. I uninstalled and reinstalled everything I could on each and every car in the parking lot until finally I leveled up. I was about to head home to charge the battery for the Mustang, but I wanted to see if my car could tow this big old trailer. I figured it was an empty tank I could use for water storage or something, but it wouldn't let me attach it. Upon further investigation, however, I realized that this was a gas tank and it was not empty. This thing was essentially a gas station that I wouldn't have to power. So I topped off my car, headed home, and spent the rest of the day reading. On day 29, I set the gang to start chopping trees again in preparation for base expansion. While everyone else chopped wood, I went back to the parking lot to grab a car. I had a change of heart though. The Mustang would be way more fun, but the box truck would definitely be more useful. So I plopped in a spare battery I had at the base and filled it with some fuel. I'm not gonna lie, I had also hoped that I could attach the fuel tank to this thing, and when that didn't work, I even tried other methods. Unfortunately, at the end of the day, it seemed like the tank was staying put. Once I got home, I went to work sawing the logs that had been gathered during the day, and I finally leveled up in carpentry so I could build those large rain collectors. I spent the rest of the day after that expanding our road and laying the foundation for our new building. As you could probably imagine, I spent the entirety of day 30 working on our new building. That is until I ran out of wood at the end of the day. On day 31, I assigned a new work area for chopping trees and spent the whole day looting like a pack rat. The most notable things I grabbed were two industrial propane tanks and a storage shelf for our new building. Most of the rest of the stuff was just food. Day 32 started with some building construction, followed by some road extension. After that, I took my car out and found this trailer that I decided to keep. Then I got one of these, and my game crashed. When I reloaded the world, I kept my progress that I had made during the day, but it reset the time to 5am again. Kinda weird, but not a big deal, so I continued on with my new trailer to Gigamart and got even more food for the base. I made another crate and just chilled for the rest of the day since the crash reset the time of day, but not my character's tiredness level. On day 33, I realized I had made a mistake with my build. So I took the box truck back to the warehouse to see if I could find a sledgehammer. Unfortunately, I did not find one, but I did find Shirley and several fuel barrels that I decided to take back to the base. On day 34, some dummies decided to try to raid us. 
Luckily, this group was pretty unprepared. We took care of the two in the base, then found the rest were spread out all over the place. A pretty uncoordinated attack. After that, Shirley and I headed to the tool shop to see if maybe I had missed seeing a sledgehammer last time I was there. I did not. So, I just settled on taking these tool cabinets as a consolation prize. We then went up to the video store and grabbed a TV and some VHSs for the house. Day 35 was pretty uneventful. I wanted to continue my search for a sledgehammer, but then the helicopter showed up again, so I just decided to stick around and work on the base. No zombies showed up, which tells me that we did a pretty good job clearing the local area. The most eventful thing that happened was that I placed another wall in the wrong spot. Son of a gun, I did it again. I need to get, I need to get the sledgehammer. Day 36 was another pack rat day. I was still looking for a sledgehammer, didn't end up finding one, but grabbed a bunch of stuff for metalworking. Day 37, I went back to the warehouse again, this time for boxes of nails, screws, and any metalworking materials I could find. And I managed to grab some cool car parts. Day 38, I spent most of the day labeling and organizing our food crates, and then disassembling doors in nearby houses to get enough hinges to build a garage door on our new building. Day 39 was spent building more storage, the crates for heavy metal sheets and pipes, the shelves were going to be for general crafting materials, the toolboxes were for, well, tools, and then the military lockers for our weapons and ammo. Day 40, I felt like I needed a few more crates, and then I spent the entirety of the day actually sorting everything into their proper places. Day 41, so much building. On day 42, I tried to finish the building that I worked on all day on 41, but I couldn't because I placed the walls in the wrong order and didn't have a sledgehammer to fix it. <sighs> I then spent the rest of the day pulling weeds to make my drive a little smoother. I woke up on day 43 to a rainforest on my roof. Under normal circumstances, I can get down with some greenery, but this wasn't really the look I was going for. And then, right as I finished pulling plants off the top of my stairwell, Oh no, I just freaking broke my leg. And if that wasn't enough, right on cue a group of bandits showed up, just walked right in and killed Benjamin. We managed to scare them off, but not before Raider Frank shot me in the head. Are you kidding me? I was pretty upset by everything that had happened, but I was even more upset at the fact that I had intentionally put sentries on the roof of the building to prevent things like this from happening, but they just sat there and watched. I reassigned everyone to guard on the ground floor and went to bed. On day 44, I figured I wasn't going much of anywhere with my injuries, so I worked on the road until I ran out of wood. I also went to the pile of corpses and took Benjamin's clothes. Look, I know this makes me a bad person, but mine had holes in them and his were cooler. Plus, it's not like he was going to need them anyway. Day 45, I made a decision. Since I had plenty of food and water in the base already, there really wasn't any good reason for me to risk my life out in the wild while waiting for my leg to heal. So I decided to do squats, and a lot of them. I even got myself some workout clothes for the montage. Day 46, 47, 48, 49, and 50, I spent all day, every day doing squats. I decided at some point during that time to cut my hair as well, but then finally, there it is. Level four in fitness. Then something not so awesome happened. Uh, so my game crashed and I lost all of my survivors. I'm not gonna lie, this really bummed me out. The base felt so empty and I felt so alone. The one silver lining in all of this was the fact that my game was now running way smoother. It's almost like the game prefers not having a thousand mods installed. Anyway, it seemed like my movement speed was back up to normal by this point, so I took the splint off of my leg and I spent the rest of day 51 finishing the road in our base. On day 52, I decided I wanted to level up my metalworking, so I went house to house disassembling sinks, toilets, stoves, refrigerators, and anything else I could take a torch to. 
Day 53 kind of ended up as a wash because I spent the whole day going around town looking for a specific vehicle, a Jeep. I had all these really cool attachments for it, so I wanted to put them on there, but I didn't end up finding one. Day 54, I woke up and I was determined to either find a sledgehammer or that Jeep that I was looking for. Having checked all the major spots I knew of in Riverside, I decided today that I would instead head over to the next town to check out parking lots and the local tool store. But I quickly recognized my hubris when I saw how many zombies there were and realized that I was alone. I did keep driving around for a while though, hoping that I'd find that Jeep, but no such luck there either. With the day coming to a close, I thought to check one more place on the way home, and that was the country club. I started heading up the road towards the entrance when... Oh, my car is dead, man. Luckily, I wasn't quite as weak and fragile as I once was, thanks to all those squats. So I was able to take out the zombies in the immediate area. The situation was obviously less than ideal. I was too far away from home to simply walk back, so my only option was to find a new car. Thankfully, I always keep extra gas in my cars in case of emergencies like this one, so I grabbed that and the car's working battery and set out on foot. There were a lot of zombies on the way to my destination. I snuck down the winding road towards the club and luckily made it to the guard gate around the time it was getting dark. It was by no means the most secure place, but I was already overexerted and getting tired, so this place would have to do. I went to sleep on day 54 in an office chair with one eye open. On day 55, I used the tried and true method of attracting one zombie at a time out of a group. I might have been able to take them all on, but in Project Zomboid, acting on those thoughts is what most often gets you killed. Looking at these cars in the parking lot, I wanted something that was in pretty good shape. At first I thought about that truck, but I knew my standard battery wouldn't work for it, so I went over to the sedan in the corner that seemed pretty much untouched. And when I popped the hood... Oh, sick. Oh, and it has get. Oh my gosh, this car is just ready to rock. So, I smashed the back window and got it hotwired. Man, I cannot tell you why, but having a working vehicle again made me feel so much safer. I drove around the area just to see if I could spot a Jeep, and in the process met Deborah. We didn't find a Jeep in the country club area, so I thought while we were on the way home, I would just check out the parking lot of the warehouse. You know, it was really nice finding Deborah too. She's the first survivor I've seen in... <sighs> You know, searching for this Jeep has put me in a lot of really bad situations, so I decided to give up. I lured the zombies away from the parking lot and decided to take this Mustang instead. But while I was herding the zombies away, I did notice something. Is that a sledgehammer? Oh my gosh, it is. Dang it, now I have to go find- <laughs> I have to figure out a way to get it. I finally made it home, and for the first time in a very long time, I actually had zombies in my base. I quickly took care of them and then spent the rest of the evening expertly maneuvering the broken Mustang into the garage. Man, it felt good to be home. So day 56, I stayed local and I worked on my mechanics and metalworking skills with the goal of fixing and upgrading my new car. Day 57, I spent more time leveling up I also went back to the bookstore and then the school library, grabbing more books and magazines for crafting. While driving home, I realized that I had forgotten about the Mustang that had been right next to our base this entire time. So I took that one home as well, figuring I could use one of them for parts. Okay, day 58 was kind of funny. Due to the awful state of all of my other cars, I spent the day getting this red car working. It took a while because I would grab the gas, head over there, then remember I didn't bring the battery, so head back. Then, when I finally did get the car working, the doors were locked, so I broke one of the back windows, but didn't equip my bat, so I scratched my arm. Then, the car wouldn't let me get in through the back window that I had just smashed, so I had to smash another window. But the lock on that side of the car was broken, so then I had to smash the driver's side window just to get into the car. Now this once nice car was not very safe anymore, so I drove up to the parking lot and traded parts with a version of the same vehicle. Yeah, that was my day. On day 59, I was going back for that sledgehammer. I found the spot, grabbed the hammer, and managed to get back to my car. 
I then met a survivor named Dean. I spent the rest of the day trying to get him out of the bad situation that he was in, but he adamantly refused to get in my car. At the end of the day, he died as he lived. Like an idiot. On day 60, I was finally able to use the sledgehammer to fix my building. It was like finally being able to scratch just a terrible itch. I also made a new friend, Jordan. I felt pretty good about this guy since he was already at the base and so out of danger. I worked on the car for a bit and got the orange Mustang ready to drive and parked it in the garage. Day 61, Jordan and I took a drive over to the mechanic shop that was by the warehouse. I was hoping that I could find parts for the Mustang, but unfortunately didn't find anything. Then we went over to the self storage area and again we weren't able to find any Mustang parts but we did snag an extra generator. Day 62 I spent the morning swapping out the tires from the broken Mustang to the working one. Then I spent the day pack ratting again. Everything was going fine until... Jordan, why didn't you just move? Don't bandage yourself on the freaking stairs. At this point, I was starting to think I was cursed to never have friends again. Day 63, I wanted to make my apartment feel a little more homey. So I installed a stove, some countertops, a rug and chairs, and finished it off with a bookshelf. Day 64, I was once again a dummy and didn't start recording. Look, this is my first time doing this kind of thing and it's a lot harder than you think, I promise. Anyway, all I did was continue leveling up my metalworking and use the trailer to gather a bunch of logs we had left all over the neighborhood. Day 65, I was finally able to craft some of the Mustang parts that I wanted, like a roof rack for storage and some window protection. On day 66, I took my souped up Mustang around Riverside and cleared as many zombies as I could find. And in the process, I met Lisa, who I immediately took home and told to stay safe and never leave. I went back out to clear more zombies and of course also looted a bunch of stuff. Day 67, a dude named Ethan just walked through my bedroom at five o'clock in the morning. I guess he heard we were recruiting and wanted to be the first in line. So I invited him and set him to guard outside the garage. And then a little later when I was checking out this motorcycle, this other dude named Steven showed up. Now we were getting somewhere. I spent the rest of day 67 working on the base, mowing the lawn, sawing logs, and then building a sidewalk around our entire road. I even extended our parking area, and at the end of the day, it was looking really nice. On day 68, I spent a ton of time just trying to back in this trailer, and ultimately gave up and parked it over by the box truck. I then spent the day restocking my metalworking supplies by salvaging old car wrecks around the area. Then we were raided again. I got a few of them, but got shot in the groin. I circled back around and was able to take out the last one, but my boy Steven was badly injured. He just stood there getting shot and didn't fight back. I tried to save him, but he was too far gone. Day 69, I decided I wanted to trade out my old beat up blue car for something a little bit cooler. On the way, I met Campbell, and then Campbell and I headed over to a parking lot that I had marked earlier and got to work on this bus. This thing was a beast, and I was pumped to add it to my collection. Once I got it home, I crafted and installed a roof rack for it and felt pretty awesome. Day 70, we woke up nice and early and I grabbed Ethan, Campbell, and Lisa to help me get some more wood for our next construction project. We gathered quite a bit, so much in fact that I had to switch out the bus for the box truck for more inventory space. We gathered logs for the rest of the day. Day 71, I spent the whole day using the wood we gathered to build this cool looking gatehouse so raiders couldn't just walk in. But after building the door, I wasn't able to lock it. I thought it was just my choice indoor, so I put in new ones and still the same issue. I then learned you can only lock doors from the inside and if you wanted to lock doors from the outside, you would need to use a doorknob that you already had a key for from a zombie that you've killed. Wait, what? So this entrance was essentially pointless because it would keep me out as well if I wanted to lock the door. Day 72, I gave up on the gatehouse for a moment and instead started laying the foundation for my next building. Having learned from my mistakes this time, I put the corners down first. I spent the rest of the day putting the floor down until I ran out of wood. On day 73, the ineffectiveness of my guard gate was made even more evidently clear when this jerk Duncan just showed up looking for a fight. Unfortunately for him, he chose the wrong people to mess with. Later, I took the gang out to gather more wood, but then the helicopter showed up again, so we cut our trip short. We headed back to the base, but on the way saw a group of survivors held up in a house. We now had Lynn, Stuart, and Sandra as part of the crew. 
I brought everyone back home and then took Lisa, Ethan, and Campbell back out to get some more wood now that the helicopter was gone. On day 74, I decided to destroy my stupid gatehouse and opted for a more simple solution. I did this on the other side as well and then built a gate for my main entrance. Obviously this was more for aesthetics than anything because as we learned, one cannot simply lock doors. That being said, I did like it though. It made me feel kind of classy. Then I spent the rest of the day laying more floor. Day 75, we gathered more wood. And just a heads up, you're gonna start seeing a trend. Day 76, I worked all day on my new building. I thought it might be cool architecturally to have an overhanging roof. So I made what was going to be the front walls into columns. I then made the front windows and realized that if I toggle this protect from erosion option on the glass, they wouldn't randomly break like my other buildings. Good to know. I spent the rest of the day working on the roof. Day 77, I woke up early and started pulling weeds off my new roof. I then spotted Adam sneaking about and invited him to join our crew. Then, you guessed it, I spent the rest of the day gathering wood. Day 78, I spent the day continuing to build the roof. After that was done, I did some yard work around the new building to make it look a little bit nicer. Day 79, more wood. On day 80, I took the box truck out to start gathering beds. One of the things I wanted for this new building was a place for all of my residents to sleep. And at the end of the day, I ended up with 10 beds. Day 81 started with some yard work on the roof. I then worked on the interior of our new building, first walling off the sleeping area and then working on what would eventually become a bathroom and an armory. After that, I went back up to the roof and built the railing. I then headed back to the police station to snag some of those lockers to go in our new armory. On day 82, I literally spent the whole day moving around inventory and setting everything up in the armory in a way that I liked. Day 83, I went around grabbing lights, a toilet, sinks, cabinets, and a mirror to make our bathroom. I then decided to build a table that I could display some of our weapons on in the armory. And then after that, I had this great idea that I needed the box truck for. On day 84, I started building my very own Spiffos. I was having a great day until raiders literally spawned in my base. What are walls even for? Anyway, I got shot in the leg and in the foot, which made chasing the bastards down very difficult. Luckily, Elaine, my resident doctor, was on call that day and she helped fish the bullets out of my body. Once my wounds were stitched, I was able to catch up with one of the raiders and get my revenge. Being raided is so frustrating, but there is one silver lining. If you catch them, they usually have a weapon and a good amount of ammunition. On day 85, I wanted to take a break from building and try out this new assault rifle I got from one of the bandits. It was pretty awesome. I spent the whole day just mowing down hordes of zombies outside of the warehouse area. On day 86, I claimed that I needed to find more axes in my recording so I could chop more wood, but I think subconsciously I was just craving violence because I went over to the next town to loot the tool store, but instead spent the whole day clearing out the town by myself. So many zombies, so many bullets, but so much fun. I spent so long doing this that I ended up staying the night in the gas station in town. Day 87, I woke up and started the process all over again. That is until I ran out of ammo and had to get, well, oh, creative. Just FYI, this is way fun to do, but absolutely terrible for your car. I looted the police station and then I finally made it to the tool store, but not a single ax was there. I left without finding what I was looking for, but I still felt pretty accomplished as I drove away from this battlefield. On day 88, I remembered a backpack that I had left on the floor that had some axes in it. Hence why I said on day 86, I'm not sure if the axes were the real reason I went over there. I used some wood glue to repair the broken axe and then took the gang to once again gather wood for the rest of the day. On day 89, I worked some more on my rooftop spiffos. And since I had some extra planks, I thought to make a second parking lot because I was already parking my truck over here anyway. And at the end of the day, I think it was a pretty good decision. On day 90, I decided to replace the ugly broken windows on my first two buildings, making sure this time to toggle the erosion protection. I built another ammo cabinet and went back to spiffos to grab another set of booths. 
I thought it might be fun to grab some of those kitchen appliances as well and spent the rest of the day working on my rooftop restaurant. Day 91 was a pretty chill day. I just went around salvaging old cars to get metalworking supplies so I could keep Frankensteining my Mustang back to life. On day 92, with only eight days left, I decided I wanted to go out on one last big adventure. I had been wanting to hit the military surplus store for a while, and I figured now was the time to do it. So I grabbed some of my newer friends, Adam, Davey, and Shona, and we headed out. We decided to take the northern route that went along the highway, and along the way we made a pit stop to check out some big building on the map. It ended up being empty, but man, this place was awesome. It would have been a perfect base. Anyway, we got back in the car and started heading to the store. But it was getting late, so we got to a spot along the way that was pretty clear of zombies and decided to sleep in the car until the sun came up. On day 93, we announced our arrival to the local zombies and let them come from all sides. They came in waves, but we dispatched of them pretty handily. Once it was clear, we walked right through the doors and into redneck heaven. There was so much stuff. I also found this awesome silencer for my pistol that I was very excited about. I decided to start outfitting everybody in some new clothes when some raiders showed up, but that was a big mistake on their part since we were armed to the teeth and by this point I was quite the marksman. We looted what we could from the store but there was so much that it would have been impossible to grab it all, even if I had brought the box truck. We spent the rest of the day joyfully fighting hordes of the undead because we had no fear of running out of ammunition. We woke up on day 94 and headed home triumphantly. It was a pretty long drive, so it took most of the day, but everyone celebrated when we returned with our spoils. We had so much stuff, I had to make yet another storage container just for ammunition. On day 95, I finally finished my spiffos, and I have to say, this is by far my favorite part of the base. And now that my base was finished, I figured there was only one thing left that I needed to do. I took out my bus, turned on the siren, and worked on properly clearing out Riverside once and for all. This mission continued on day 96, and there were a couple really notable moments. Check this out. On day 97 and only three days left, I went around just grabbing things that I wanted. Some lawn chairs, a few park benches, and a trash can. I then just kind of walked around my base for a while. I had spent so much time here and it was almost over. Day 98, I spent the day getting some more vehicles that I've had my eyes on. This nice SUV that's just been sitting here untouched. I was finally high enough level in mechanics to remove a window without smashing it to get in the car so I could keep this car looking nice. I also grabbed this motorcycle that I've had my eye on for a while and then this four wheeler because why not? That night I just sat in my room and pondered for a moment on what tomorrow would bring. On the morning of day 99, I knew what needed to be done. I spent the day going around the area and gathering the necessary equipment. And on the evening of day 99, I hosted a barbecue with all of my friends to celebrate our new township and how far we've come. On the morning of day 100, I took one last stroll around my base. I then got on my motorcycle and drove away. I parked outside a familiar house and returned finally to where it all began. On day 101, I went back up to the rooftop to find that most of my crew was still enjoying the barbecue that I had laid out for them. I sent everyone back to their posts and went to work. I wanted to take my Mustang out for a drive, but when I opened the hood, I do not remember doing that to the car. I was able to repair some of the damage to the body, but I still wasn't high enough level in mechanics yet to repair the engine. So I worked on my mechanic skill by uninstalling and reinstalling parts on each of my cars. While doing this, I also came to the conclusion that in order for me to continue to maintain and upgrade these vehicles, I would also need to level up my metalworking as well. So I grabbed all the propane tanks I had, threw them in the back of the car, and headed to the gas station. Just a note, I added a mod that lets you refill propane tanks at gas stations because you can do that in real life. 
Anyway, I'm not sure why, but for some reason I had the impression that I had a generator over by the gas station already, but alas, I did not. So I slept in my car with a new goal for the next day, which was to find a new generator. Day 102 started with a breakfast run to the milk and more, followed by some bad driving. I salvaged a vehicle, then repaired the hood and got back on track looking for a generator. I fought some zombies, found a shipping container which I marked on the map, looted garages and sheds, fought a hostile survivor named Blair and took their gear, and then went home and sorted all the stuff I had scavenged into the base. Not a bad run, but I wasn't able to find the generator I was looking for. On day 103, I continued my search, starting with some of the local houses that had garages, but to no avail. I then drove around to parts of the town I hadn't previously investigated to see if maybe there was a spot that generators might spawn. It didn't look very promising until, oh my gosh, there's a jeep. This immediately derailed my current project, and I spent the rest of the day cannibalizing other cars in the area to get the jeep back to a good condition. I took it back to the base and added all the cool attachments I've had sitting around in storage for so long. I then parked it next to the Mustang where it belonged and went to bed. When I woke up on day 104, I decided to write down some of the things I wanted to accomplish moving forward. First was obviously finding the generator, but I also wanted to find a lawnmower if possible, repair the Mustang, expand the base, and bring the shipping container and fuel tank home. With some clear objectives in mind, I grabbed my buddy Campbell and hit the road once again in search of the generator. We went around checking some garages, but still couldn't find one. So we decided to expand our search radius to an area we hadn't explored yet. I figured there would probably be some zombies, but Campbell and I were both armed, so I wasn't really worried. Even when the helicopter showed up, I was still undeterred. Campbell and I were veterans of the apocalypse at this point, and we were checking out rural housing. How many zombies could there be? When we pulled up to the first house, there were a few zombies, as expected, so we hopped out of the car and started clearing. A few more showed up, and we cleared them too. And then more. A and then... I had to reload, but my shotgun magazines were empty, and my pistol just couldn't clear them. No, Campbell, no! I spent the next several hours fighting wave after wave of zombies, and when the battle finally finished, there were so many bodies on the ground that I couldn't find my friend to bring him home for a proper burial. What's even worse is that the building he died to investigate didn't even have what we were looking for. I slept alone in my car on day 104. I awoke to a thunderstorm on day 105. It felt pretty fitting given what had happened the day before. Despite the danger, I continued to explore the farmhouses alone. I went around checking barns and garages until finally I found what we were looking for. I went home, cooked myself some vegetable stew, did my squats, and then went to bed. On day 106, I marked off that I had found the generator that we were looking for, and then added a new item to the list, which was to find a treadmill. Now knowing I would have a more consistent supply of propane, I decided to salvage some wrecks on the road to make driving around town a little easier. I hooked up the generator, refilled some tanks, salvaged some more cars, and then on my way home I found this beat up old red truck. It had this cool patina look and a wood-lined truck bed, so I decided to hook it up to the Jeep and bring it home as a fun project car for later. On day 107, I woke up nice and early and decided to take out the box truck with the goal of hooking it up to the shipping container to bring it back to our base. When I got to the container, I backed up my truck, but when I went to connect it, nothing. I thought maybe for some reason it only attaches to one side, so I drove back home, grabbed a sledgehammer, drove back, destroyed the fence, backed up to the other side, and still nothing. Finally, I drove back over to the fuel tank to see if maybe I could attach that, but again was disappointed. It looked like the plan of taking these things back home was dead, but just out of curiosity, I backed my truck up to a vehicle I knew I could tow, and that's when I realized that my box truck was the problem and couldn't tow anything. So I went home and grabbed my bus. With the fuel storage attached, I first took it over to the gas station to refill the massive thing, which took forever. And then I parked it at the entrance of my base so I could easily refuel before leaving or coming back from a trip. I then went back over to the shipping container, hooked it up, and parked that bad boy right outside our garage. 
another thing to check off the list. On day 108, I went on the hunt for a treadmill. I thought that I might be able to find one at the local motel, so I grabbed Adams and we headed over. Unfortunately, there was nothing there, so we headed over to the Riverwood Boat Club to check there. We weren't able to find a treadmill, but we did manage to find another library of books that I decided to scavenge. After that, I knew what must be done. There was one place I knew for sure that had what I was looking for, but unfortunately, it was not close. So I spent the rest of the day stocking up my Jeep for the long and dangerous road trip ahead of me. Day 109, I woke up, got in my car, and made the long trek over to Rosewood. I knew that the treadmill I was looking for was in the Rosewood fire station. I had figured this was going to be a quick mission that was going to require stealth, so I decided to do this one solo. As I drew closer to Rosewood, the road seemed to just end, and was replaced by a forest. I kept pushing forward, but this was not a great situation to be in. The trees made it difficult to find a direct path to drive through, and blocked sight lines so I couldn't see where zombies were coming from. Despite all these red flags, however, I continued forward. That is, until I had to get out of the car to clear some zombies. In retrospect, I should have used my silenced pistol rather than my shotgun, because now every zombie in a rather large radius knew right where I was. I spent the next several hours dealing with the horde I had inadvertently created. Finally, after the battle, I was able to make it to the crossroad right outside of Rosewood. But there was a major problem starting to set in. It was getting dark, and I did not have a safe place to sleep until morning. It's one thing to fight in the forest in broad daylight, but it's an entirely different beast to do it at night. I thought it might be a better idea to try to circle back to an area that I had previously cleared as a potential safer spot to sleep but was quickly forced into my nightmare situation. I did the best I could to stay within range of the headlights of the car, but when I ran out of shotgun ammo, I had no choice but to flee from the area and do my best to buy myself time to reload. It took a while, but eventually there was a calm once again. I hesitantly slept in the car that night, hoping I wouldn't be surrounded in the morning. On day 110, I woke up feeling a little sick. Not surprising, due to the fact that I slept parked on a pile of corpses, I drove back to the crossroad and once again did my best to clear the zombies nearby. While doing so, I came to the unfortunate realization that with all the trees and wrecks blocking my path, it was probably better to go scouting on foot first. My plan was to go in quietly and avoid the main street, instead opting to use the side roads in hopes of getting to my destination. I was able to make it to a location that was pretty close to the police station before it started getting dark. I decided I would attempt my break-in when it was light outside the next morning. I found a police car and went to sleep again hoping for my safety. Day 111, my fears became a reality, and I woke up to zombies knocking on the window of the car. I managed to deal with them quietly with a crowbar, but after that I was unable to go back to sleep. So I sat quietly between two cars keeping watch while I waited for the sun to rise. A little after 5 o'clock, I started to make my way towards the police station. I started taking zombies out with my crowbar, but when more showed up, I switched to my pistol and used the last of the ammo that I had. After that, I felt I had no choice, so out came the shotgun, and you can probably imagine how that went. It took me a while, but eventually I was able to carve a path through to the police station. Once inside, I had to fight my way to the armory, but once there, I was not disappointed. I looted what I could carry and even found a handy flashlight I could use with my pistol. I felt much better now having resupplied, and after fighting my way out of the building, worked my way over to the Rosewood fire station. At last, I found my treadmill, but the zombies were not going to let me get it without a fight. I had zombies coming in from all sides, and I spent the rest of the evening fighting them off, until I was finally safe enough to go upstairs, grab a bite to eat, and move some furniture around so I could sleep a little more soundly that night. Day 112, I woke up and started looting the fire station. After some time, I came to the realization that if I was going to make it out of here with the treadmill and even half the stuff I wanted, there was only one solution. I was going to have to cut my way out. So I grabbed an axe and started clearing a path that I could drive through. I was lucky enough to find a car in the parking lot that was pretty much ready to go, so I loaded it up with what I wanted and determined that the next few days were going to be pretty labor intensive. As I continued to grab stuff that I wanted to take home, I bumped into a survivor named Elizabeth. This mission had turned out to be quite a bit more involved than I had originally anticipated, so Liz was a welcome sight. 
After that, we moved the furniture back in place and went to sleep. The first thing that we did on day 113 was get Liz equipped with some better gear. And then we went to work. I would chop trees while Liz would watch my back. We would make it a little way up the road and then grab the car and inch our way forward. At some point, we did stop to make another run to the police station so we could grab Liz a proper weapon, but then it was back to work. Chop some trees, shoot some Zs, and then drive. Rinse and repeat, all day, until we took a break to sleep in the car for the evening. Day 114, we continued with the plan, until we met another survivor named Carol who we invited into our group. I figured anyone who could survive here alone is definitely worth recruiting. We spent the rest of the day making marginal progress until we found a place to hold up for the night. Day 115, we got up nice and early and on the way out of the building met Kathleen. She already had a rifle and a full set of military gear, so I thought to myself, what a great addition to the squad. That is, until she freaking bailed on us immediately in the middle of a fight. And I have no idea where she went. After that, things calmed down. Liz, Carol, and I got back to work clearing a path for the car until it started getting dark and we found another spot to rest. Day 116, we finally made it back to the Jeep and started loading up our spoils. It was such a triumphant moment that even Kathleen decided to show up. Are you kidding me, Kathleen? How did you... Wow. At long last, we were going home and it felt great to get out of this forest. After a long drive, we made it back to a familiar place and I spent the rest of the day sorting our stuff into the base and checked find treadmill off the to-do list. I started out day 117 with a nice jog on my new treadmill. I then spent the whole day just working on my cars. I needed a day to recover from all the craziness that had happened in Rosewood. On day 118, I grabbed Liz and Adams and we went around town grabbing spare engine parts and more metalworking materials so I could rebuild the Mustang's engine and build window armor for the Jeep. We did so successfully and I ended the day with more treadmill time. On day 119, not a lot happened. I woke up a little after 10, and then by the time I had recovered from my morning run and had eaten, it was already one o'clock. I checked repair Mustang off the list, and then I started coming up with a plan. I wanted to make it a little bit safer to drive on the road, so my plan was to clear zombies between Riverside and the next town over. After my morning jog on day 120, we got raided. Unfortunately for the raiders though, they walked into a hornet's nest and we took them out pretty quickly. Unfortunately, however, not before Ethan and Reload Liz got shot. You may be wondering why I've named her Reload Liz. Well, it's because ever since I gave her the rifle on day 113, she has never stopped reloading. Anyway, we patched the two of them up and I worked on getting everything together, loading up the bus for what I was calling the road mission. It is at this point I'd like to draw attention to this. This is what we call foreshadowing. Just keep that in mind. Once the gear was loaded, I recruited Ethan, Adams, Shona, Reload Liz, and Kathleen and set off. I wanted to give Kathleen an opportunity to redeem herself after running away in Rosewood. We refueled at the gas station and slept in the bus ready to get rolling early the next morning. On day 121, we embarked on our mission to clear the roadway of zombies. The task was simple enough, drive until we saw a group of zombies, disembark, clear the area, and then continue. With the amount of people that we had, this was basically as simple as target practice. That is, until raiders showed up. I don't know how or why, when we were raided just yesterday, but a huge wave of raiders showed up and took us by surprise. Everyone tried to scatter, but they got reload Liz in the leg. She wasn't fast enough, and neither was I. Once we handled the group, I turned my attention to Ethan, who had sustained quite a few injuries himself. We regrouped and started looting the raiders for their gear, when I got the notification again. We were being attacked again! Adams, Shona, and Kathleen ran for cover, but with Ethan's injuries, there was no escape. I too was injured, shot in the arm, but I didn't even stop to look until I had killed every bandit in sight. It was on day 121 that my war with the Riverside Wraiths began. But I will warn you now, things get a lot worse before they get better. On day 122, I mourned my friends, but I felt the mission needed to continue. We needed an open road if we were to expand our operation. 
but this time I would not be caught unaware. I grabbed myself an additional weapon, one that had a longer range so that I could take out wraiths before they got too close. I spent the rest of the day arming myself and putting additional food, ammunition, and tools in the bus so we could continue what we had started. At least, that's what I had thought. On day 123, my entire crew was gone. Not just those who had witnessed the events that had happened two days ago, but everyone. I guess word got around that we were going to continue the mission, and they lost faith in me. I wish I could say I blame them. As painful as it was to lose everyone, I didn't have time to mope about. More raiders could strike at any moment and I needed a crew. This time though, this time I would do things different. I would keep the crew small and loyal, mainly so my game wouldn't crash again. The first to join was Carrie, followed by Grant, and then at the end of the day, Donald. On day 124, I was grateful for my new recruits, but wasn't ready to rely on them yet. There was something I needed to do first. I got in my car and returned to where we were ambushed just days prior. I found the bodies of my friends so that I could give them a proper burial. I then scavenged the corpses of the wraiths and vowed that I would have my revenge. I then spent the rest of the day clearing zombies off the road, alone. Day 125, I woke up in a random house I had cleared out the night before on the side of the highway. I spent the rest of the morning finishing the mission and making it to the next town over. Once I was finished, I started heading home when I ran into Bruce along the way. I invited him to join us and thought it was funny that he had a gas mask and a bulletproof vest but was wearing blue jeans. So I called him Brucey Blue Jeans. Once we were home, I went to work making graves for Ethan and Reload Liz. For some reason, it wouldn't let me rotate the crosses, but I do fix this later, don't worry. It was driving me crazy as well. At the end of day 125, I donned the armor that I had given to Liz and went to bed with a heavy heart. On the morning of day 126, I had decided that since we were going to be keeping the group small from now on, I wanted to give everyone a call sign. So Survivor Grant became Grant Collins, call sign Roach. Brucey Blue Jeans became Bruce Moore, call sign Silver. Donald became Donald McNally, call sign Ice. And then right as this was going on, our last recruit walked in the door. Survivor Anne would become Anne West, call sign Cobra. And finally, Carrie became Carrie Keller, call sign Ghost. This was the new squad. And now you will feel just as bad as I do if they die. Now that we were all formally acquainted, I took everyone into the armory to get them outfitted with some proper weapons. The Riverside Wraiths must have gotten word of my new recruitment because right when I was outfitting my new team, we were met with some resistance. They came with numbers, but I had the firepower. Once they were dealt with, I had Roach patch up Cobra, and we moved all of their bodies outside the gate. After that, I finished getting everyone weapons and made the decision that tomorrow we would head over to the military surplus store to get everyone properly outfitted. On day 127, we woke up, hooked the trailer up to the bus, and headed out towards the military surplus store. Last time we went, we took the northern route along the highway, but I figured this time, since I had put a great deal of effort into clearing the road between Riverside and this little town, that we would head straight across and then go north. So that's what we did. And as I had hoped, we didn't run into any trouble until we were halfway through the neighboring town. This was the first time putting the new crew to the test, and I'd say we handled it pretty well. We pressed forward a little bit, and there were a few more zombies than I had anticipated, but after some time we cleared them out as well. We continued this way, inching forward and clearing zombies, but this process was taking a long time, and I didn't want to have to sleep on the road. So I decided to just press on and avoid the zombies for a while. That is, until I felt the number of zombies was getting too big to just ignore. If we didn't handle them now, then we wouldn't be able to drive home this way. At least that's what I told myself. There is an almost optical illusion that sometimes happens when you are dealing with zombie hordes, where you underestimate the amount of zombies due to their distance from each other. When they aren't clumped up together, the numbers seem more trivial, as if you can take them down in waves. It isn't until they converge that you fully understand what you've done. But by then, it's too late. First Roach, then Ice, Silver and Ghost were MIA, and all I could think was that it was my fault. Cobra and I fought wave after wave, and as the night settled in, it was beginning to look like we were the only ones left. As we cleared out what felt like the last of them, hope returned when out of nowhere, Silver came running back to us. 
I thought that maybe if Silver managed to survive, Ghost did too. I grabbed my flashlight and went out looking for her in the direction that I last saw her running. But as the storm raged on and the darkness settled in, it seemed like the best course of action would be to wait and look for Ghost in the morning. I guess none of us slept well that night, seeing as how we woke up around 3 o'clock on day 128. I got out of the bus and surprisingly found a survivor walking in the storm through the piles of zombies. We were down in numbers, so we invited Marion to join. She was Marion Smalls, and I gave her the call sign River. We hopped back in the bus and decided to wait until the sun came up before going out searching for ghosts. We searched for a while before I finally decided to open up the survivor menu to confirm my fears once and for all. Silver had managed to escape, but Ghost did not. Silver, Cobra, River, and I made the rest of the journey to the military surplus store as the storm raged on outside the bus. We spent the rest of the day getting everyone outfitted with new gear, and loading up the bus and trailer with more weapons, ammunition, and fuel barrels. We then spent the night on cots in the store. We woke up to snow on day 129, and as we were getting ready to leave, we found another survivor sneaking into the store. Mark Connors, callside Midnight. Since we were here already, we got him some equipment too before heading out. Today I wanted to do things different and learn from my mistakes by going nice and slow clearing small groups of zombies when we saw them so we wouldn't get surrounded. But unfortunately, tragedy does not often concern itself with intention. Despite my best efforts to be careful, it was happening again. I was so concerned for the others for a moment that I wasn't even paying attention to what was happening to me. I was able to buy silver, cobra, and midnight in an additional second, but it almost cost me my life. I was able to get myself sorted out and circled back around to save Midnight, and then turned my attention to the others running towards where I had last seen them, and that's when I saw Cobra. I don't know how she did it, but Cobra managed to make it out of that insanity. After that, Silver rejoined by my side, then River. Soon Cobra got back in formation, and we stood our ground and fought together, and then in an unbelievable turn of events, the whole crew made it out alive. Cobra, Silver, River, and Midnight. With the most shocking, frankly, being Cobra. After that, I went back and picked up my mask that had been ripped off my face, and then we cleared a nearby house that we could sleep in for the night. On day 130, I had a change of heart. I was just gonna drive through the zombies and not worry about clearing them until we made it back to the bulldozer, a place we had obviously already cleared. I marked the spot on the map and then checked out what kind of condition the bulldozer was in. I think bad would be an understatement here. However, it was not entirely impossible to fix. It would just require a considerable amount of time, effort, and resources to do so, which seemed about par for the course with how everything was going thus far. Since we were pretty close to the little town we frequently stopped by, I figured we could go back to clearing the road, especially since we would want it cleared when we eventually came back for the bulldozer. And we had already done quite a bit of clearing here anyway. So we walked a little ways, and with the range on my rifle, the zombies were easily taken out without even being noticed. I felt pretty good until... We spent the next several hours sitting in an open field trying to take zombies out from as far away as I could manage. Thankfully this worked and we were able to successfully wait out the helicopter event before getting back in the bus and heading for the town. Since it was getting late anyway, we decided to hold up in a local house and happened to bump into another survivor named Colin. He was still wearing his inmate jumpsuit, so we gave Colin Biggs the call sign Cell. We didn't have any additional military gear, so we took Cell across the street to the police station to get him outfitted. With that, our crew was full again, and we slept in town that night. Day 131, we woke up early, hopped in the bus, and headed back to the base. It was so nice to be back, and I was so ready to spend a little time working in the safety of our home. My first project was going to be expanding the garage. I started by connecting my two buildings into one since the space between wasn't really serving any function. I then took out the glass and added an additional garage door. At the end of the night, after my jog on the treadmill, I was about to go to sleep when I heard some trouble outside. River was being shot at by some random hostile survivor through the fence of our base. I took care of the situation but started to not feel great about our defenses. 
Day 132, I took the crew out to gather some wood for more construction projects. It was nice to see that the team could work together doing something other than combat. This went on all day and I finished the day off with another run on the treadmill. Day 133 was a building day. I used the logs to build a new room on the second story of our new combined building, as well as a bridge connecting both buildings on the compound. I then spent the rest of the day furnishing my new bedroom, and at the end of the day felt pretty good about it. On day 134, I started working more on the garage. I laid down asphalt where I wanted to park the cars, and then I decided I wanted to move the stairs from the inside of the garage to the outside to open up space on the wall. This meant I would need to move some of the stuff around from the parking lot. As I was doing so, I heard a gunshot. I got out of my car and ran over to see what was going on, but I was too late. Midnight died while inside my base. He was supposed to be safe, but he was shot and killed through the fence. I stopped working on the garage to bury my friends. Not just Midnight, but Roach, Ice, and Ghost too. I spent the rest of the day cleaning up the area and adding flowers. That night, I couldn't sleep, so I kept working on the garage, reorganizing and moving stuff around. I didn't end up going to bed until around 6 o'clock the next morning. I obviously didn't have much time on day 135 since I didn't wake up until it was already afternoon. I spent the day finishing what I had started the day prior, organizing everything, parking vehicles in the garage, and then clearing the vegetation on my newly built tiles. I took some sleeping pills that night to get my sleep schedule back to normal. Day 136, I began working on my next major project, something I should have done a long time ago, the wall. I had thought I could live here in peace, but I am being constantly reminded that I am at war. I first laid the corners and then got to work building the main sections, but before too long I ran out of wood. I had known that this was going to take a lot of wood, but it wasn't until I had set the dimensions that I realized just how much it was really going to need. I figured in order to accomplish this task I would need a lot more axes. So I got on my four wheeler to scour the town until I remembered a better solution. So I headed home to switch gears, literally and while doing so met Karen Judge, call sign manager. I got her outfitted and took her with me to start salvaging vehicles and looking for a donor car. I grabbed quite a few engine parts and then found the perfect donor, a Gigamart box truck. Okay, look, on day 137, I forgot to press record. I know, I know, but this is the only time it happened, I promise. All I did was get the Gigamart truck ready to drive by charging its battery and filling it with gas, and then loaded it up with a bunch of metalworking stuff so we could go get that bulldozer. Day 138, I woke up nice and early and headed out with my donor truck to go make the switch and repair the bulldozer. I pulled up to the bulldozer around 10.30 a.m. and then worked on that sucker, repairing and replacing parts until I finally left with it around 5.40 p.m. It was a long and slow drive back home, and on my way I had a thought. To both test out what this thing could do and make my life a little easier, I wanted to make my own bypass from the highway to the street that my base was on. So I hopped off the road and started heading through the trees, and I was not disappointed. Unfortunately, there was a fence that ironically couldn't be knocked over by the bulldozer, so I left it there and made my way back home and to bed. On day 139, I took my sledgehammer and opened up the fence for my bulldozer and other cars to get through. I then used the bulldozer to chop down a bunch of trees while I had my crew gather all of the logs. I then snagged a pickup truck to help speed up the gathering process before bringing everybody home. I spent the rest of the day unloading the miscellaneous items I had put in the box truck during my garage renovation so I could use it to haul logs tomorrow. Day 140, we had another run-in with the wraiths. They tried to use the fog to their advantage, but I had the high ground and a long-ranged weapon, so it was not the best move. Only three showed up, which had me a little worried since usually they came with a lot more, so I stayed on my guard. I walked the perimeter before getting in my car and doing a sweep of the neighborhood. Once I was convinced no more were hiding, I went back and grabbed all those logs. I did almost die to over encumbrance during this though. Just FYI, if you make four stack bundles of logs and then unbundle them, you will likely drop the logs on the ground, but the ropes used to bundle them will remain in your inventory and will crush you to death if you are not careful. It took me a second to figure that one out. Day 141, I worked on the wall. Day 142, I worked on the wall. 
Day 143, we gathered more wood, and then I worked on the wall. Day 144, Silver and I went on a run to the local warehouse to try to find more boxes of nails, but unfortunately we had already picked this place clean. I did find a new helmet though, which was pretty cool. Next we headed over to the self storage place in hopes of finding some boxes of nails there. We checked every single storage unit until finally we found some boxes at the very end of the day. Day 145, if you guessed that I worked on the wall again, you would be correct. And I did so until I once again ran out of nails. Day 146, I woke up nice and early and was once again on the hunt for nails. I asked Cobra to join me and the two of us took the Mustang out and started checking garages around town. While checking out some of the houses south of our base, I noticed that on the other side of the fence, quite a few zombies had accumulated. So I decided to head over there to clear them out. That's when I spotted Survivor Marie in a bit of a rough spot. We already had a full squad, but I didn't want to just leave her here to die, so Marie Fredericks joined the team as Lucky. Cobra, Lucky, and I spent the rest of the day going house to house checking garages, closets, and sheds to try to find more boxes of nails. We slept in the car that night to continue our search in the morning. Day 147 was more of the same. I think at the end of the day, after all the searching, we had a total of three boxes of nails. We also found this awful house just filled with zombies that I marked with the nope face. With the few boxes we had, we returned home to continue with the fortifications. Day 148, I worked on the wall some more. The project was really coming together, but the three boxes of nails we had went by in a single day. We were so close to finishing the fort, but the nail shortage was starting to weigh on me. Day 149, I searched all day for more nails. Despite looking all day in any place I could think of, I didn't find a single box. It was time to think of a new plan. On day 150, I decided that the best chance of finding a good amount of nails would be for us to travel to the warehouse area outside of Muldraw. It was going to be dangerous, and I was worried that the roads might be overgrown like what we had seen in Rosewood. So there was really only one conclusion. We were going to have to take the bulldozer. So I grabbed the rig and started loading up for the trek. Right before I was about to leave, I was approached by Ruth. Something you need to know about Ruth is that she has been walking in and out and around the base for probably the last 10 days. Since she basically already lived here, I decided to invite her in and Ruth Adams would be known as Relentless. Since she was so eager to join our crew, I decided to take her with me on this expedition. And let me tell you, it was quite a feat. The thing about the bulldozer is that while it is a formidable machine with a lot of utility, it eats through gas and is extremely slow. We had a full tank when we started and by the time we got just one town over, we were on empty. Since we were going to have to stop and refuel here anyway, I decided we should check out the farming supply store just in case. Unfortunately, no nails, but surprisingly there was some armor. So I grabbed a new overcoat for myself and some gear for Relentless. Before we left town, I stopped by the tool store as well, and there I did manage to find a few boxes, but not enough to warrant turning around. So we pressed forward with the mission, driving a short distance only to get out and refuel again. This continued on day 155. Drove a little, then stopped and refueled, until finally we made it to our destination. Luckily this place wasn't covered in trees like I had thought, which I was grateful for, but it did make me feel like bringing the bulldozer might have been a waste. However, I did not have this feeling for long. Relentless and I spent the whole day going from warehouse to warehouse looking for boxes of nails. And at the end of the day, I was proud to say that between what we had found at the tool shop and here, we now had 16 boxes of nails, more than enough to finish our fortifications. And even more than that, while we were looting, I found an exoskeleton, which would make construction work a lot easier when we got back to the base. On day 152, it was time to make the long trek back home. We made a decent start towards the base before I had a thought. And that thought was that I never wanted to have to drive this bulldozer long distance again. So if I was ever going to clear a path through Rosewood, now would be the time to do it. So Relentless and I made a detour and cleared a drivable path down the main street of Rosewood for any potential future endeavors. Everything went quite smoothly and we went in and out of Rosewood without much trouble. Everything was fine until our fuel barrel ran out of gas. We only had half a tank left, and in this thing that would not get us very far. I kept checking the map to see how much further until we made it into town. We were so close, 
but the gas was going so quickly. Finally, right as we passed the threshold of the town, the bulldozer's engine puttered out. I spent the rest of the evening finding a car I could siphon fuel from, and then I drove the bulldozer to a safer location further in town. And then I had to come up with a plan. In order to get enough fuel to get home, I was going to need to find a generator in this place and hook it up to the local gas station. So that's what we did. On day 153, we went around town checking sheds for a generator, and luckily for us, it didn't take long to find one. We took it over to the gas station and plugged it in. We refueled the bulldozer and our large gas can and headed off towards home. As soon as we got home, I didn't waste any time. I got back to work building our fort. We were so close and now we had all the nails we could need. I spent the rest of the day building the railing for the walls and I made it all the way around until finally with just a small section left, we ran out of wood. Oh, so close. On day 154, I woke up and took a second to admire how everything was coming together. It was a lot of work, but I'm super happy with the way that it's turned out thus far. At this point, I had finally come up with a name fitting of our settlement. Moving forward, this place would be known as Fort Matthew. If you hadn't watched the first 100 days, you probably won't get that reference. I took out my truck and got the last bit of wood that I needed to finish the railing along the final wall. With the final piece in place, I felt like we had made real progress against the Riverside Wraiths and any other hostile survivors out there. For the first time in a while, I felt safe enough to take off my armor for a moment and just relax. I cut my hair and trimmed my beard and took another moment to appreciate Fort Matthew. I put my armor back on before going to bed, but I went to sleep on day 154 happy. A feeling that unfortunately was about to change. Day 155 nearly broke me as a person. A perfect storm crafted for my demise. In the morning, two things happened simultaneously. We were being raided and one of my generators caught on fire. I figured I needed to deal with the hostiles first since they had the ability to shoot, but by the time that happened, the fire was already out of control. My armory and barracks were gone but I thought I might be able to save the other building if I could keep the fire from crossing the street. I kept running back and forth to the sink to refill the few buckets I had in efforts to keep the fire at bay, all the while forgetting about the bridge I had built on the second floor. My efforts were in vain, and my settlement was gone. The day after I finished building Fort Matthew is the day I lost it. All of my food, all of my supplies, all of my hard work, and what's worse, we lost manager and silver with them. That night, I added two more of my friends to the graveyard and went to sleep in my car in the burned ruins of what used to be my home. On day 156, I took my remaining crew, Lucky, River, Cell, and Cobra, and we headed out of town. I wasn't going to give up on Fort Matthew, but I no longer had what I needed to rebuild. We had to go somewhere we hadn't looted yet. We had to go to Rosewood. Not wanting to get there in the dark, we decided to spend the night in our little town next door. While we still had a little time left in the day, we went around gathering food and other resources to keep us going. Along the way, we met Tracy Banks and gave her the call sign Omen, hoping that she would bring some good fortune our way. We spent the night in a house nearby. On day 157, we loaded up in the truck and began our journey to Rosewood. On our way out of town, we saw a survivor named Ronald. I didn't have room in the truck for him, and he seemed content enough with where he was at. So we wished him well as we drove past. It was a cold and snowy day when we arrived in Rosewood, and I had not anticipated the zombie resistance we would encounter. I suppose driving down Main Street with a bulldozer earlier drew some attention. We were able to make it back to the fire station, a place I figured should be relatively safe since I had already cleared it out, but I was wrong. We hopped out of the car and formed up to take out the few zombies we saw coming. Unfortunately, the trees hid how many there really were. The moment they broke from the tree line, I had to reload and our formation had faltered. Even now, I don't know why River didn't fight back. She just stood there. Was it because she didn't have any fight left in her? Or was it perhaps to give the others the chance to escape? Either way, I was once again forced to live with the death of a friend. Just as things seemed to be calming down, another even bigger wave came and we were surrounded. Omen, Lucky, and Cell were all in a rough spot being closed in on. I tried so hard to save them that I almost got bit myself. Now Cell was gone too. 
We continued to fight the zombies back and were able to regroup and reload for a brief moment before more were drawn in. Eventually I found a spot where I could lure the zombies through a choke point and we were able to finally clear the area. Despite the zombies being dealt with, the work was not yet over. These trees were going to get us killed. We lost Cell and River because we couldn't see or shoot at what was coming, so I grabbed an axe and started chopping down the trees out front. After that I hooked up the generator that I had brought and we set up our makeshift barricade again while we slept. On day 158, I figured if we were going to be staying here for a little while, I wanted to at least clear the vegetation in this room. I was still feeling the loss of our friends, so I decided today I was going to do some scouting on my own. Starting with the police station, so I could grab some more ammunition. While walking through the building, I met Barry Stevens and called him Blackjack. I had planned on scouting alone, but Blackjack was insistent, so I let him tag along. We went to start checking houses and garages for boxes of nails and other equipment, but in the process were harassed by just a ton of zombies and a frustrating amount of foliage. At the end of the day, we were able to find a few boxes of nails and another generator. Day 159, I took the whole crew around town clearing zombies and checking different houses, stores, and other buildings for nails. We were luckily able to find a few more boxes, but not a ton. We ended our day in the local grocery store where we found a bunch of canned food and other goodies and spent the night in the office on the second floor. On day 160, we kept on the move, working our way from house to house, garage to garage, looking for nails and trying to stay alive. We were making good progress, but these dang trees made everything so much more difficult. We had no way of knowing where or how many zombies were around at any given time. We were constantly rolling the dice. We did the best we could, but eventually it just felt like there was no end, and this was a battle we should walk away from. On the way back to the station, we did pick up another survivor, Katrina Reed, callsign Hurricane. She actually helped us out of some sticky situations during the day, so she had already earned her spot. At the end of day 160, we started unloading our spoils into the truck and trailer, and had successfully looted 17 boxes of nails over the last five days. Not a bad haul, and should be enough to help us repair what we had lost. On day 161, Cobra, Blackjack, Lucky, Omen, Hurricane, and I disconnected the generator and loaded up for the long, cold drive back to Fort Matthew. I felt bad for everyone sitting in the back of the truck during this awful blizzard. We pulled into the charred remains of what used to be a settlement, and I set everyone to guard inside as I went out to bury Cell and River. It was too cold and windy to do much of anything else, so I went to a neighboring house to sleep through the storm. On day 162, I began the incredibly long and grueling process of breaking down burned walls and replacing them with new ones. I figured this time around I would change up the look, since just redoing exactly what I had done previously might have actually drove me insane. This way I could at least pretend like I was doing renovations. This went on all day, and the next day, I grabbed some wood, met a weirdo wearing shorts, named him Snow, and then went back to building. And the next day, only partially interrupted by a freaking raid. Oh man, I was angry, but I guess no better way to take out my anger than on the bastards who did this to me. Plus, now I had more ammo. Anyway, back to building. At the end of day 165, I had finally rebuilt all the exterior walls and fences of Fort Matthew, with the exception of doors. On day 166, Blackjack and I took out the Jeep and went around from house to house disassembling doors for doorknobs and hinges. We also grabbed a television, an oven, and as many outdoor lamps as we could find. We got that stuff sorted at the base and then went out again later that night to grab some furniture from the local bar. Day 167 was a pack rat day. My main goal was to find metalworking stuff like a propane torch and tanks, but we also just looted whatever good stuff we could find. Replenishing food storage, getting general crafting materials, and stealing more outdoor lighting. On day 168, I took out Lucky and a new recruit Fang, and we headed over to the warehouses to look for propane tanks and torches, which we were indeed fortunate enough to find. We also found an antique oven for funsies and some more fuel barrels. I then started salvaging some vehicles in the parking lot for some metalworking supplies, and then we headed home.
On day 169, I woke up with a bad feeling. Another group of raiders trying to take me down. They were smart enough not to siege Fort Matthew head on, but not smart enough to stage a proper ambush. I expertly sniped two of them through a house. Yeah. I then found the rest hiding in a corner behind some trees. Not the best tactics, I have to say. After that, I decided I wanted to make towers or areas of my wall that jutted out a bit so I could shoot at zombies or raiders that were right up against my wall. So that's what I did. I successfully made the first two, unevenly I might add, but it did work. On day 170, I started work on the interiors of the base. I started by trying to set up a solar power system, but honestly, I couldn't figure out how to make it work. I grabbed some countertops and added them to our kitchen area, I made some new rain collectors, and then installed lighting in a bunch of different places. On day 171, I installed a sink in the kitchen and installed some countertops and stools in the bar area. And then the most amazing thing happened. A new survivor showed up walking around our base, and his name was Matthew a spiritual successor to the Matthew of old, and I gave him the call sign Sarge. But as is tradition when something goes my way, the Wraiths had to send a squad to ruin it. Once again, they opted not to charge into the base, but once again, they were underprepared to deal with me. After I had finished hunting them down, I found one of the raiders was in possession of a new weapon that I quite liked. I added my silencer, light, and scope, and was now deadlier than ever. On day 172, Snow, Blackjack, and I went up to the self-storage area to grab some extra generators that I had marked earlier. After that, I added a soda machine to the bar area and then worked on setting up storage around the base, sorting items from the shipping container where I had been dumping everything into their proper places. On day 173, Sarge and I went out on a salvaging run, chopping up old car wrecks to get a good amount of metalworking supplies. We did this most of the day, circling back around to stop by the gas station to refill the propane tanks on the way home. Then I got a familiar notification. I honestly have no idea what I'm doing to constantly be attacked, but that's twice now in four days, and they are getting smarter, trying to attack me while I was away from my fort. I had no interest in dealing with them during the evening and out in the open, so I just drove home. The next morning, I went on the hunt for some raiders. After taking out the trash, I worked around the base some more, building storage for weapons, ammo, and gear, as well as storage in the garage for metalworking supplies and tools. I finished the day off by finally making doors for the buildings. I spent day 175 grabbing more furniture with Omen. First some booths for our kitchen area, then more countertops for the armory area. I then finished off the day by building some more industrial lights along the wall. On day 176, I took Omen and Blackjack out to salvage more vehicles, this time looking for light bulbs and more scrap electronics so I could build more lighting for the fort. By the time I finished with the lights along the wall, 1 o'clock in the morning looked like it was 1 o'clock in the afternoon. I spent most of day 177 working on my Mustang. I was able to repair it a good amount and even build a new spiky bumper to protect the hood and kill zombies. I had been working on the base for a little while now, so I wanted to take a break for a second and go scouting around a new area. Once I loaded the car up with some supplies, I hopped in and headed off. I stopped for the night in our gas station safe house. Unfortunately, on day 178, my scouting dreams were crushed once I drove down to Moldra and realized that it was in the same condition as Rosewood, with trees everywhere. The only difference being that Moldra was way more populated. Those two things together made a 10 out of 10 nope sandwich for me, so I promptly turned around. I figured while I was out here, I might as well scout around, but ultimately I didn't really find anything worth noting. On my way back home, I decided to drive around parts of the neighboring town that I hadn't visited yet to see if maybe I had missed a lawnmower or something. Unfortunately, that wasn't the case, but I did see that Ronald was still doing well for himself, which is always nice to see. I drove home, and almost immediately after parking in my garage, I was once again being attacked by raiders. Blackjack decided this time that he wanted in on the action, so he posted up and started sniping them. The two of us worked together for a minute until he got tagged, and I made sure to get him patched up. Once I knew he was safe, I hopped on my four-wheeler and headed over to finish off the invaders. That's when I saw this guy Paul standing up to the raiders, risking his own life to save ours. I dispatched of the last of the raiders and invited Paul Johnson into the crew as shield. 
Unfortunately, day 179 literally ended up with nothing happening. I was devising a plan to take the bulldozer over to cut a path to the military base through the forest because I found this gas trailer, but when I tried to attach the trailer to the bulldozer, I learned that bulldozers can't pull trailers. So there goes that plan. On day 180, I invited Cobra along for a trip to go get a new car. I had marked on the map this cool red truck that I had wanted, and I figured why not today? So I brought over a bunch of supplies and traded parts with my current black truck to get it working. It took most of the day, but I was pretty pumped about my new ride. On day 181, it was time for some more construction projects, and you know what that means. We needed more wood. So I took the crew out and had them gather logs for the entire day. Did I feel like I was running a prison camp by having all these people gather logs in the snow while I sat in the car? Yes. But was it effective? Also yes. I ended up just sleeping in the car. On day 182, I loaded up all the logs and we headed back to the fort. I then spent most of the day sawing the logs into planks and then constructed another tower on the wall. On day 183, I began work on a proper tower, one that would let me see the whole neighborhood. I decided since the solar panels weren't doing anything to just build over them. By the end of day 183, my main observational guard tower was complete. On day 184, I began working on another new building. This was going to be my medical center. I first laid down the roof so I could see where the road was and then worked on the walls. After that, I took the truck over to the local pharmacy to grab some additional medical supplies as well as some metal cabinets for storage. Towards the end of the day, I added lights to the new building and then spent the rest of the evening removing foliage from my new tower. On day 185, I went on the hunt for a few more things for our medical center, mainly a sign and an examination table. My first thought was to check the school to see if they had a nurse's office, but when I couldn't find one, I decided to take the truck and head to the next town over where I knew there was a doctor's office. I pulled up, grabbed the sign that I wanted, and went inside to find the examination table, but it was too dark to see and I did not bring my flashlight. Plus, I heard zombies knocking, so I decided to come back in the morning when I could see better. I parked my car in a nearby barn and slept in it for the night. On day 186, I returned to the doctor's office, now able to see what I was doing. I looted more medical supplies, medical furniture, said hello to Ronald, and then headed home with my haul. Once I got back, I set up the medical room in a way that I liked, and sorted the medical supplies into the building. On day 187, I decided I wanted to start trying some new things. With the state of Fort Matthew now, we were once again thriving and no longer had to worry about the day-to-day -day survival anymore. So I invited Sarge on a fishing trip. I had marked the house earlier that had fishing equipment in it, so we grabbed that and then headed up to the bait shop. On the way there, I may have gotten a little overconfident with my car's front bumper, so I swerved to hit the zombies rather than to avoid them, which was fine until it wasn't. Unfortunately, I didn't have the tools on me to attach a new tire, but the car still seemed to work with three wheels well enough to get us home, so I wasn't too worried about it. Sarge and I grabbed some additional gear from the bait shop and then went to work. I first laid down some nets, and then for the first time in my zomboid career, I went fishing. At first, it was pretty underwhelming. I sat there for hours not catching anything. I switched my bait a few times until finally I caught my first fish, a small sunfish. Now that I knew it worked, I was ready to fish all night. Until... Wait, 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 wait. Oh, please don't... No, 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 no! No! Not on my fishing trip! Believe it or not, that was almost it for me. I got shot in the neck and was really low on health. I needed medical attention badly, but my car was currently surrounded by raiders. I ran all the way from the bait shop to my base at the southern end of Riverside. I hopped the fence and ran into the medical center asking Fang to tend to my wound. After she had fished the bullet out and stitched my wound, I ate some food to regain some strength, I grabbed my rifle that I had so foolishly left behind, and I was not going to sleep until I killed every last bandit and brought Sarge home safely. I hopped on my four-wheeler and headed back up to where we were ambushed. 
Once I arrived, I was relieved to see that for some reason they hadn't spotted Sarge. I then used the advantage of stealth and range to take down the wraiths who attacked us. Finally, I cornered the last of them who put their arms up to surrender. But I offered no mercy. Where was their mercy when they killed Ethan, Liz, or Midnight? Or even when they ambushed me in the streets or shot me in the neck on my fishing trip? Sarge and I hopped back in the Mustang and drove home. Day 188, I decided to sleep in for some obvious reasons. When I did wake up, I walked back to the bait shop to grab my fishing nets and my four-wheeler. I decided I still liked the idea of fishing, but thought it might be better to do it a little closer to the base. So I put my nets in the water just outside of our neighborhood, and then after that I spent some time reading books in my room and watching movies, and then grabbed a few things to help me fall asleep at a reasonable hour. Day 189, I wanted to continue to get better at fishing and other skills I hadn't really spent time on previously. So I went to the bookstore to read up on some of those skills. I then went back to the spot I had set up the nets and spent the day fishing some more. While the sun was out, I was able to catch a three foot pike and another fish, but when the sun started going down, I ended up only catching shoes and socks. I guess it matters what time of day you go fishing, which is good to know. Day 190, with only 10 days left, I decided to try my hand at trapping. So I made a couple wooden box traps and set them up in the forest where we usually get our wood. I then walked around trying to level up my foraging skill as well. For someone who had survived this long, I was pretty bad at the skills under the survival category. I foraged for a while until I heard the helicopter coming, so I hopped back on my four-wheeler and headed back to the base. I spent the rest of the day sitting in my tower watching the helicopter fly around. I hope they are impressed, whoever they are. On day 191, I woke up so excited to check on my traps. I drove over first thing in the morning and found that I had caught two rabbits. I rebaited my traps and then drove over to my fishing nets to see how those did. For some reason, most of them broke, not sure what caused this, but I did get quite a few little bait fish. Once I got home, I wanted to work a bit more on my cooking. Up until this point, I had just been making vegetable stew, so I was excited to try something else. But I soon realized that I had basically ignored grabbing anything in the cooking category up until this point. I didn't even have a cooking knife. So I spent the rest of the day going house to house gathering cooking supplies, pots, pans, bowls, baking trays, muffin trays, and other things of that nature. Then I went to Gigamart and started grabbing ingredients like oil, flour, sugar, and butter. Finally, at the end of the day, I made myself a pancake. After the amount of friends this man has lost, after the amount of broken bones and bullet wounds he's recovered from, after the things he's built only to have destroyed and then built again, this man deserves a pancake. In fact, I decided to fully enjoy this moment. The armor was coming off and it was time to just be a guy for a bit. Day 192, I grabbed my satchel and my rifle, but left the rest of my gear tucked away. I wanted to try to relax a bit. I took out a car that I usually don't use and headed back up to the bar to grab some tables and chairs to use for the bar that we had built. I then spent the rest of the day watching movies in my room. Day 193, I decided it was time to retire the orange Mustang in favor of the silver one. The orange one had been repaired so many times that each repair was becoming less and less effective. So I moved the Jeep and then transferred the accessories over. After that, I used the Jeep to pull that broken down old truck I picked up back on day 106 into the garage to repair it. It wasn't too tough to get the body back in good working order, and fortunately, I already had a few spare tires sitting around. The biggest thing was getting the spare engine parts, so I took out my motorcycle to go find some. On the way, I ran into a single zombie, and I took his hat. I grabbed some engine parts, and while I was at it, grabbed some more movies that I could watch like Breaking Points and Dead Wrong. And of course, I also grabbed the popcorn machine. Once I got home, I repaired the engine of the truck, and now all this guy needed was for its battery to charge overnight. On day 194, I had an idea that I was going to need some additional space for. So I opened up the wall a bit more on the fenced in side of our base and began moving cars that I used less frequently out along the side of the fence. I thought with my new medical facility, we needed some proper first responder vehicles parked in these spots. So I ran over to where I spotted an ambulance the day before and brought it back home. I then ran over and grabbed the fire truck that had been sitting in the parking lot forever. Day 195, we were being raided again, but their attempts were futile. 
I sat comfortably on my wall and dealt with those raiders without breaking a sweat. I spent the rest of day 195 watching the sunset over Fort Matthew in my tower. With only four days left, I decided there was one last thing I wanted to do. I fueled up my vintage truck and set off to the little town next door to visit an old friend. I spent the whole day driving around looking for him. I was starting to worry that something may have happened to him until finally I saw him posted up in the doctor's office. My old friend Ronald. Ronald had survived just as long as I had on his own, but I wanted to at least offer. Ronald kindly accepted, and it felt only fitting that Ronald Drake's call sign was Survivor. It was getting a little late, so rather than head back at night, I decided to stay one more night in the gas station safe house. This place had been a haven for me on multiple occasions, so I felt bad that I hadn't cleaned it up yet. I spent the next little while removing the weeds from around the apartment, and finally this place was looking like a proper safe house. Day 197 started at 3am when I felt like something was wrong. Wraiths were coming, and this was not Fort Matthew. We were surrounded, and they were in the building. At first, I posted up keeping my eyes locked on the stairs, but it didn't seem like they knew we were up here. I heard footsteps in the snow, so I knew at least a few of them went outside. I took two out from the window, and then a third that came up the stairs. After that, I snuck out the back door and was able to catch them unaware. I have no mercy in my heart for raiders and I took them all down. But clearly this affected Ronald, seeing as how he wouldn't move from that spot. I guess our experiences up until this point were quite different. Once we got back to Fort Matthew, I realized something. These last few days I had been playing house and getting fat, but if we were going to continue to survive, I needed to always be prepared. We got lucky at the safe house, but things could have gone very differently if they had charged up the stairs. Playtime was over and it was time to change. I had gained some weight and stopped working out ever since I lost the treadmill in the fire, so on day 198 I ran up to the top of my tower and did squats for the entire day. Day 199 I spent the day patrolling around the base. These people trust me to keep them safe. We have nice things but there will always be dangers and I have to be ready for them. On the morning of day 200 I donned my heavy armor once more and we thanked those who had fallen to make Fort Matthew a reality. Let them be the last. It's crazy to think about how far we've come. What had started out as a small community so long ago has grown into a fortress that offers protection to those seeking refuge near Riverside. But not everyone lived in Riverside. And with that thought, on day 200, I picked myself up and began preparations. On the morning of day 201, I gathered the crew together to explain the plan. I would be leaving for West Point, and in my absence, Lucky would be left in charge. She was the senior most member of the community behind Cobra, but Cobra was coming with me. I had wished I could take more people, but as we learned previously, there was a good chance the roads were overgrown. So it seemed the only real shot we had was to take the bulldozer. The drive was slow going, but we managed to make it most of the way to West Point before deciding to call it a night. We agreed rolling into a new city with a loud bulldozer was an activity best suited for the daytime. The next morning we got started nice and early, but quickly encountered a problem. The zombies were to be expected, but what we didn't expect were all the cars blocking the road. This forced us to make our own path through the trees, but came at the cost of a lot of fuel. With this in mind, once our destination was in sight, I chose violence over landscaping and used the rest of the fuel to kill as many zombies as I could to give Cobra and I an opening to hop out and finish off the stragglers. This was going to be our new home for a while, and as such I spent the rest of the day cleaning up a bit. That night I slept in an office chair on the second floor. On day 203 the to-do list was back. In order to get this outpost operational I figured I should start by looking for a few generators. One for the base, and one for the gas station a block away. I asked Cobra to keep an eye on the base while I headed out to get a lay of the land. And as you can imagine, I was met with some resistance. But then I bumped into my first West Point survivor, Gary Andrews, call sign Cash. Cash and I spent the day fighting our way towards the nearest residential buildings. We spent quite a bit of time trying to make the area safe, hoping to maybe stay the night, but at the end of the day it was too risky so we headed back. Day 204 put a hold on other plans when we started to feel sick just walking around the base. Which, looking at our yard, made sense, so we spent the whole day piling corpses. Even with all that time spent yesterday, we had only made it through about a third of the zombies laying around, 
So on day 205, I had Cash and Cobra stick with it while I took the bulldozer out to try to grab a bed and track down some generators. I already knew where the bed was, so I headed there first, knocking down trees along my way to try to make the path more accessible for future use. I also figured since Cash and I had already spent an entire day here fighting zombies that this part should be relatively easy. I was wrong. I used the bulldozer as best I could to thin the herd, but with every one I ran over, it seemed like two more took their place. Plus, with every pass, I was using more fuel, and it would be game over for me if I ran out while being surrounded. I decided to fall back and ditch the bulldozer to handle the rest on foot. It took a while, and nearly all the ammo I had on me, but eventually things calmed down and it started to rain. I hopped back in the bulldozer and grabbed the bed while the rain washed away the snow outside. Now it was time to look for the generators. While Cash and I were exploring yesterday, I noticed a self-storage building close by, so I headed over there to check. I found a bunch of cool stuff like some armor and this weird faceless mask, and eventually I did manage to find a generator. So I packed it up and headed home. I hooked it up outside and our new base was finally online. I replaced the office chair with a proper bed and updated my to-do list. I still needed to find an additional generator for the gas station, but I would also need to clear out the gas station before we could hook it up. In addition, I needed a new car, preferably one with towing capabilities so I could start moving wrecks off the road. On the morning of day 206, I headed towards the gas station. And honestly, it went pretty well, all things considered. I obviously spent the day fighting zombies, but it paled in comparison to what I had dealt with yesterday. After the area was seemingly safe, I headed back over to the self-storage building, hoping there might be another generator hiding somewhere. And fortunately, there was. As I made my way back over to the gas station, I bumped into another survivor named Anne. I explained that I would love to have her join our squad, but we already had somebody named Anne in our group, and it might be confusing. But then she said, oh no, that's totally cool, Anne is actually my middle name, my first name is Nora, and I was like, oh, that works great, and Nora Frost joined the crew as Bugs. After that, we connected the generator to the gas station. Now all we needed was to come back tomorrow with some fuel. As Bugs and I were about to start the long walk back to the base, I noticed this car was in weirdly good condition. So I popped the hood to confirm, and it was fully functional. Bugs and I hopped in, got it hotwired, and drove back to the base. On day 207, I once again hopped in the bulldozer to go knock down some trees. On my way over, I thought I saw a survivor in the woods that might be in a rough spot. I hopped out to lend a hand, but soon realized this guy had really messed up. After that, I figured I couldn't just leave him out here. Plus, now he owes me one. So Gerald Olson joined the crew as Badger. While I didn't want to leave him out here, I also didn't really want to take him with me. So I dropped him off at the base to help with cleanup duty. With that detour out of the way, I continued on towards the gas station. I spent some time working my way around the area to make it accessible to vehicles. And fortunately, didn't really run into too many zombies in the process. With the gas station now secured, I turned my attention to finding a good utility vehicle. Originally, I had written down that I wanted a truck, but I couldn't resist the opportunity to Mad Max a military bus again. It wasn't in the greatest shape, but I've dealt with far worse. All this thing needed was a battery, so I grabbed the car battery charger I had sitting in the bulldozer, and within a few hours, the bus was alive again. After that, I left the bulldozer at the gas station and headed home with my new ride. Now that we had what we needed to start removing cars from the road, I wanted to start making my way into the city, first by trying to capture the police station. In addition, our food supplies were starting to run low and would need to be replenished soon. As for the base, I needed to build some rain collectors so we could get some running water, and I needed to do some general inventory management. There was plenty to do, so I decided to just start at the top. I loaded my metalworking gear into the bus and went to work salvaging cars along the road. Doing so not only made the road more accessible, but also gave me the materials I needed to start repairing and upgrading my bus. There were so many cars that I couldn't finish it all in one day, but by the time I got home for the night, my bus was in great condition and now had a roof rack and a spiked plow off the front. On day 209, the crew had finally finished moving all the heavy bodies around, so now it was time for them to switch gears and start moving all the heavy logs around. I only feel bad that Cobra is stuck doing it with them, but she's the only one I trust to be left in charge. 
I finished salvaging the last of the cars and decided to park this trailer near the base for later use. As I was heading back into town, I saw a familiar troublemaker lurking nearby. If he wasn't gonna help around the base, then he might as well help me scout. We first headed to the gas station to refuel the bus and grab a bite to eat, then we started pushing forward on foot into a new part of the city. We only made it about half a block before we had to stop and fight, which was fine until I ran out of ammo, promptly ending our trip for the day. Once we were home, I spent the rest of the evening adding some armor to the bus before heading to bed. You know those days where it feels like anything that could go wrong does? Well, that was day 210. Since I ran out of ammo for my rifle yesterday, I decided to switch to my shotgun with the intention of making my way towards the police station to resupply. But when I walked outside, the weather conditions were less than favorable for this type of mission. I tried to wait it out, but after three and a half hours, I gave up and started walking over to the gas station to pick up the bulldozer. I made it most of the way there before running into a small group of zombies, which I quickly dealt with using my pistol. My silenced pistol. I then noticed a slightly larger group and switched to my shotgun. You may see where this is going. It's fine, it's fine, everything is fine. At least it was until my shotgun also drew the attention of survivor Alex. I quickly ran for cover behind the self-storage buildings, hoping he'd lose interest in me and rather focus on the zombies chasing him. His rifle outranged anything I had on me, so I needed to plan my attack carefully. Once I saw him reloading, I closed the gap and totally beefed it. I was so focused on catching him off guard that I didn't realize I had run out of ammo. I kept trying to reload, but kept inserting an empty magazine. I still had plenty of ammunition, I just needed to open the stupid boxes, but by that time Alex was in the wind and I once again had to deal with the zombies. I was extremely lucky to have already made a sizable dent in the horde and managed to kill off the rest of the main group. I say extremely lucky because as I was finishing off the stragglers, wouldn't you know it, Alex came back and he shot me in the foot. I limped my way behind some trees for cover while I bandaged my foot. I knew he was coming for me, so I figured the best chance I had would be to try to use the trees to catch him off guard. Goodbye, Alex. Thanks for all the stuff. After that, I started limping over to the gas station, looting zombies along the way. I wasn't able to accomplish what I had planned for the day, but at least I could bring the bulldozer back to the base to get an early start tomorrow. As I was driving back home, I accidentally bumped into this motorcycle. This was not the first time I've run into it, and having already had a frustrating day, I decided I should just use the bulldozer to push it to the side once and for all. What actually happened was the bulldozer just knocked it over, then ran it over, and ended up getting stuck. Because of course it would. It was getting late and I was out of options, so I left the bulldozer and limped my butt back home. I had Cobra stitch me up and I went to bed. Day 211, I woke up nice and early with a plan to get things back on track and decided today I would invite Cash to come with me. First, we took the bus over and used it to rescue the bulldozer. Once it was free, we swapped vehicles and took the bulldozer up to the houses we had visited earlier to grab some food. After that, it was time to cut a path towards the police station. We made it about halfway up the next block and I spotted one of my dream cars, a Humvee. As much as I wanted to check it out, we had already started to draw a crowd. Cash and I hopped out of the bulldozer and at first we were working well together. But as we started to get surrounded, Cash began to panic. I did the best I could to cover him while he got his bearings, but he was too far gone and ended up running away. The best thing I could do for him now would be to draw the zombies away and hope I could catch up with him later. Once I finished cleaning up, I went out looking for him in the direction I last saw him run. But with the fog and all the trees, finding him seemed impossible. I figured he knew where we were heading, so he might think to rendezvous over there. I began heading up the road, and on my way, bumped into a new survivor named Joanne. She agreed to help me find cash, so I invited her into the crew as Joanne Gaines, call sign Shiplap. We continued up the road and found more zombies waiting for us. I decided to use my pistol rather than my shotgun, hoping to not attract more, when... Cash! Unfortunately, he was still in shock and immediately ran into the trees. Shiplap and I cleared the zombies on our side of the woods, hoping he would run back our way. It seemed to work, but when he broke from the tree line, we could tell he was wounded. He was bleeding out, but he was too freaked out to do anything about it, and he wouldn't hold still long enough for me to bandage it. 
I kept calling out to him, and with only a few seconds left, he finally came to his senses. I managed to dress his wound, but this trip was over. Since there were only two seats in the bulldozer, I left Shiplap on guard while I took Cash home to rest. I then hopped in the Camino, did some car swapping, but ended up bringing Shiplap and the bus home. Despite the struggles I've had over the last few days, on day 212 I remain undeterred. I was going to make it to the police station, and I was going to grab that Humvee while I was at it. Fortunately, getting over there was pretty uneventful, but for some reason the zombies did not want me to have the Humvee. After hours and hours, I was finally able to fight my way into the police station and found the armory. Success at last. I was able to replenish my ammo supply and found a cool attachment for my mask. Today counted as a win, especially when I drove home in my new Humvee. Day 213, I used the metal I had been gathering to repair my new car. I then put Shiplap in charge of growing crops for our settlement. Now that we had access to the police station, I wanted to start getting the crew outfitted a bit more. So I grabbed Cobra, Cash, and Bugs, and left Badger in charge of defending the base. First, we headed over to the gas station to fill up, but we quickly found ourselves in a situation. Before long, I had once again burned through my loose shotgun ammo and had to rely on my pistol until I could open another box. But I didn't get the opportunity before Bugs paid the price for it. We dispatched the remaining zombies and retrieved our fallen friend. We continued forward but were met with constant opposition, and eventually we got separated. Luckily, Cobra is a survival expert, and Cash is good at running. We were able to regroup, but by that time it was too late to continue on this way. So we started driving home, feeling the full weight of our loss with Bugs' body in the back. But our struggles were not yet over as we arrived home to a nightmare. We were under attack, and the others were in trouble. I managed to distract the zombies chasing Shiplap as she ran for the woods, but Badger was in a rough spot. I rammed the small horde following him against the metal plow of our bus, but he was already losing so much blood so quickly, there wasn't enough time to save him. I just didn't understand what could have caused this. We had been living here for weeks without issue. We parked a little ways up the road and went to work. Our spirits rose when Shiplap managed to rejoin us and together we were able to retake our home. With all the commotion we had caused, we attracted the attention of survivor Gail and Tracy, who came to offer a hand. Gail mentioned that I had helped her out of a tough spot earlier and she wanted to return the favor. We were happy to have them, but we would have to deal with formalities later, as I went to bed trying to wrap my head around everything that had happened. Day 214, I spent the day at home. I learned that Tracy and Gail Cutler were actually sisters, and they officially joined the crew as Cat and Collar. I then had everyone pile corpses while I buried our friends. After that, I worked around the base sorting inventory and got Cash outfitted with some extra gear I had found. Day 215, I literally spent the whole day walking around town killing zombies, just trying to make it a little safer. But there was seemingly no end to their numbers. Day 216 was a pack rat day. I first headed to the houses to finally start stocking up on food before heading over to the local warehouse to start grabbing crafting materials. Given recent events, I decided it was time to turn my attention to building some defenses. While I was out, I bumped into a survivor named Roy and invited him to join. I gave him the call sign Disco and outfitted him with a cool jacket I had found in one of the houses. After that, I headed home and spent the rest of the evening sawing logs. Day 217, I worked on the wall all day. I also built a staircase to the roof and made some rain collectors. Day 218, I worked some more on the wall until I eventually ran out of wood. Normally this wouldn't have been a big deal, but the issue was that I didn't have a sledgehammer and I hadn't left a gap big enough to drive my bulldozer through the wall. So with that, I headed over to my local tool store hoping to find one, but alas was disappointed. I did manage to grab a few more boxes of nails and ended up finding a mining helmet. Day 219, my hunt for a sledgehammer continued. Since the tool shop was a bust, I figured I'd have to start making my way over to some new houses to check in garages. 
Along my way, I found Fixcalibur and decided to have some fun with it. Progress was slow, but that was to be expected going into a new area. I made my way to a house with a shed, but unfortunately, no hammer. Despite not finding what I was looking for, things had gone pretty smoothly up until now. But that changed when Nicholas showed up. It took me the rest of the evening to secure the area again. I'm not sure if Nicholas made it out of that one. I decided to stay here for the night so I could continue my search in the morning. Day 220 started out with some batting practice, which then turned into target practice, and then something else entirely. I managed to fight my way back up to the houses I had planned on looting, thinking surely I had dealt with most of the zombies in the area. I thought it might be smart to yell and try to draw out the last few stragglers that might be hiding in the trees. Huh, I wonder if what I just did was a mistake. I managed to get the group in a line and started beating them down one by one with Big Scalibur. I spent the rest of the evening fighting waves of zombies until it was finally safe enough to sleep in a house nearby. Day 221, I spent the entire day fighting zombies. I only managed to check two garages during the day and still no sledgehammer. The only eventful thing that happened was that I finally broke Bixcalibur. Day 222, I decided to give up on checking garages for now and headed back home, fighting my way back over the corpse-ridden streets of West Point. Today was also the day that I passed the 10,000 zombies killed milestone. I made it back to my car and then back to the base where I unloaded some of the goodies I had found. My expansion plans still relied on freeing the bulldozer, but going from house to house was taking a lot longer than I expected. Especially since all this time I knew where a sledgehammer was, I was just too lazy to go and get it. Knowing what I needed to do, I decided to get myself the right car for the job. I spent the rest of the day beefing up my new car for the long trip tomorrow. Day 223, Cobra and I headed out to visit some old friends. Unfortunately, when we arrived, Blackjack informed us that most of the others were out on a supply run and wouldn't be back for a while. Bad timing, but it was still nice to see the people who were there. It felt good to be back. For the first time in nearly a month, I genuinely felt safe, which made me proud of what we accomplished here and gave me hope that maybe one day we could do the same in West Point. I grabbed what I came for and spent the rest of the day working on my car. The next morning, Cobra and I hit the road nice and early. It had been nice to visit, but we had people relying on us to come back. After a long drive, we were able to finally resume construction. I first opened up the wall and then used the bulldozer to knock down some trees, giving us both wood and more visibility around the area. I had the crew start piling the logs and spent the rest of the day trying to make the base look a little nicer. Day 225, I decided to keep up with the yard work. This place would never be quite like Fort Matthew, but I could still put effort into maintaining it. By the time I was finished, this place didn't look half bad. I spent the rest of the day sawing logs. Day 226, I spent the day working around the base, first finishing the railings and then getting rid of these blue things. In real life, they are meant to lift cars, but here they were just something to bump into. A little later, we were attacked by some hostile survivors, but it didn't work out in their favor. And then after that, I decided to continue the walkway along the wall through the building and have it wrap around to the other side. I managed to finish the floor and part of the railings before heading to bed. Day 227, I finished the railing around my walkway and then decided to take cash with me to salvage some cars for more metalworking supplies. First, we headed over to the gas station to refill my propane tank when we bumped into Survivor William, who seemed to be having some zombie troubles. We helped him out and invited him to join up with us. Feeling like he owed us for saving him, William Moore joined as Danger. After that, Cash, Danger, and I went around salvaging vehicles for parts. Once we were home, I used some of the parts to construct a refrigerator and moved the furniture from the old break room up to the second floor to start our kitchen. I then set up my bed where the break room used to be. Day 228, I decided to finally start organizing the base a little more by first consolidating and then getting rid of extra shelves I didn't need. I then walled over this opening so that hostiles wouldn't be able to get in this way. After that, I built a gatehouse along the wall, expanded the kitchen area, put gates on the garages, which to be honest, just ended up being annoying, then spent the rest of the day trying to figure out why my sink wasn't working, which I didn't end up figuring out that day. Day 229 was more base work. I spent most of the day doing inventory management, but I also decided to knock down a few walls to open up the place a bit more. That night, it seemed weirdly dark in my main lobby. 
I figured the ceiling lights must not all be in range of my one generator and decided to add finding a second generator to my to-do list. Fortunately, I already knew where another generator was. So on day 230, I grabbed Cash, Cat, and Danger and headed out to go retrieve it. On our way, we stopped by the police station for a minute and I got the crew some new gear. But unfortunately, after that, we ran into some problems. I had spent days killing literally thousands of zombies on this road specifically, so I figured we wouldn't run into too much trouble. This error in judgment caused our group to get separated and left me with very little ammunition. Fortunately, I was able to find a box of 9mm on one of the zombies. Danger and Cat regrouped with me as I was trying to reload my magazines to go save Cash, but with the other two shooting around me, we were quickly surrounded again. I tried to stand my ground while the others made a break for it, but with the trees in the way, Kat wasn't able to see what was waiting for her around the corner. I tried desperately to save her, almost joining her in the process, but it wasn't enough. After that, I ran back towards the police station where I saw danger and together we fought off the horde, which heartbreakingly included putting down what used to be our friend. Once Danger and I had finished off the rest, I retrieved Cat's body. As we were preparing to head out to look for Cash, he managed to find his way back to us, which at this point shouldn't surprise me. We broke the news to Cash as we called the mission and drove home. Today I learned the hard way that yesterday's preparations never guarantee today's success, which made it all the more painful to tell Collar what had happened to her sister. Unfortunately, on day 231, fate had one more lesson to teach. I felt I had to finish what I had started, otherwise Kat's death would have been for nothing. Despite my objections, Collar decided she was going to. She made her feelings clear when she told us that her life debt had been paid, and she would only remain with the group if we agreed to take her with us. I didn't have a great feeling about it, but the thought of coming across her lifeless body stumbling around somewhere didn't make me feel any better. We needed to be more careful, so I decided to change my strategy. I obviously made sure to bring plenty of ammo, but in addition I brought an axe with me. This time my plan was to clear the trees as we went, causing us to move at a slower pace, while simultaneously opening sight lines and giving us a better chance at retreat if necessary. I would use the sound of chopping trees to draw out smaller groups of zombies, and had planned that the exhausting work would require me to make frequent stops, forcing me to take the time to reload my magazines. I genuinely believed that this plan would work and keep us safe. In nearly the same place where Kat had died the night before, we began to draw more attention than we had hoped. Cash gave in to despair, lowering his weapon as he began looking for an exit. If we just worked together, we could have managed, but soon Danger lost hope as well, and then even Collar's hatred was overtaken by fear. In their frantic attempt to escape, they pushed Cash to the ground in order to get away. I should have been able to save him, but it was at this moment the cruel hand of fate stepped in to teach me my final lesson. My gun jammed when I needed it most, and with that, my window of opportunity closed. I looked Cash directly in the eyes as I pulled the trigger, and finally I realized the truth. I am not a hero. I'm a butcher. Despite what I've been trying to convince myself of, I can't save the people of this world. The best I have to offer is the number of zombies I take with me before I end up just like Cash. Given everything that had happened, I lost faith in my squad mates and left them to guard the police station as I set out on my own. However, I wasn't alone for long before a man named Bruce fell out of the sky, nearly landing on top of me. I told him he could tag along, but that I would leave him if he slowed me down. Bruce Thompson agreed and joined the team as Enigma. Soon after, we ran into a hostile named Steven. I picked his pockets, but the sound of combat hadn't gone unnoticed. Enigma immediately panicked and ran off. And I kept my word. If he died, that was on him. I spent the rest of the day fighting my way back to my safe house. Day 232, I spent the morning carrying the generator up the road, bit by bit, while I fought off zombies. I made it back to the police station where I had left Collar and Danger, and we headed home put the second generator on the roof, and then we buried Cash. After that, I decided to head over to the local gun store to see what I could find. I broke down the gates, and what I found inside did not disappoint. 
especially the exoskeleton suit. I spent the rest of the day getting outfitted before heading back home. Day 233, I gave Disco a cool new backpack and then decided it was time for me to do what I'm actually good at. Equipped with new gear and ammunition, I took my shotgun and headed for Main Street. But before the fight, guess what I found? Are you kidding me? There's a sledgehammer right there. Oh my gosh. If you recall on day 218 when we first needed the sledgehammer, I was right here. Well, there was a sledgehammer right here. Anyway, I fought and fought and fought some more. Stopping for a while at the bookstore before continuing to fight more and more zombies. Eventually, I ran into a survivor named Denise and invited her to join the squad, but I hadn't come up with a call sign quite yet. After that, we headed over to the clothing store where I got some more gear for the crew and a different jacket that I liked. Then something super frustrating happened. As I was heading into this building, I missed the door and ended up running into a tree, scratching my thigh, and putting a hole in my brand new armor. All of those zombies and a plant was what got me. As I limped home, I decided that Denise Moss would be known as Echo. Once we made it home, I decided to ditch the mining helmet for something a little more heavy duty before going to bed. Day 234, I decided that I needed to get a stove for the base and wanted to start looking for a lawnmower. I had wanted to find one while I was living in Riverside to help me clean up the roads and the area around my base, but I never ended up finding one. I read that they could typically be found around farms, so I marked the spot on my map. I knew there was no way I was getting a car out there, but I thought maybe a motorcycle might make it through the trees. However, it didn't take long for me to realize that this was probably not going to work either. My inability to drive around town was really starting to bother me, so I grabbed the bulldozer and spent the rest of the day knocking down trees in and around Main Street. I stopped by a house to pick up a stove, I set it up in my kitchen and went to bed. Day 235, I decided to finally start doing some of my chores. I spent the whole day labeling containers and sorting through all of my stuff. Now that the trees were gone, I decided on day 236 to take Disco and Danger out with me to get rid of the cars in the road. I decided to move the mobile generator back to the base and then use the metalworking supplies I had gotten to add armor panels to the Humvee. I gave Danger some new clothes and then we went back out and spent the rest of the day clearing more cars, marking the now drivable sections of the road. Day 237, I decided to revisit my lawnmower idea. I drove to the furthest point I had cleared and then began the long walk to the farms. I chose not to fight the zombies on the way there so I could save my ammo for any fights I might have around the buildings. I eventually made my way through the trees over to the first barn, but no lawnmower. I fought some zombies and in the process got scratched by a tree. Still not great though, since I was now limping and bleeding, but I managed to hobble my way around the group and handled the situation. I bandaged my leg and lamented at the additional hole in my armor. After that, I made my way across the street and once again found myself in a fight. Once it was finished, I stopped and slept in a nearby house. At 2.38, I continued my search, making my way from building to building, looting while I looked for a lawnmower. I also decided today that for fun I was going to use my melee weapon as much as possible. Being up close and personal always made me feel more... Ooh, ooh. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Ooh, that was real close. Finally, I feel so alive. I replaced the welder's mask that was torn from my face with a new mask that I felt suited me better. I continued to make my way around the area, carving my way through hordes, but by the end of the day, there was still no sign of a lawnmower. I'm gonna pause the story here for just a sec to give context for what happens next. Since I hadn't found a lawnmower yet, not just today, but throughout the playthrough, I went back to check the mod page to see if anyone else was having the same troubles. That's when I realized I was missing one of the mod's dependencies. Now, I'm not entirely sure whether or not that dependency would actually have anything to do with its spawn rate, but it meant that even if it did spawn, I wouldn't be able to use it properly. Leading us to this. While we're here, if you are enjoying the story so far and you think others might as well, consider clicking all those YouTube buttons people are always talking about. Day 239, I started the long walk back home. I made it a little ways up the road before I heard a familiar noise. Raiders were coming. I immediately ran for cover, 
I stayed low and stuck to the forest as I searched for them. It wasn't until I heard gunshots on the other side of the trees that I knew I was safe. At least that's what I thought. Seriously, dude? My plan on the way home was to just walk by the zombies again until I saw one with a sword sticking through it. As I defeated him, I began to hear another familiar sound. I pulled the sword free and prepared for the fight to come. The sword was sluggish, but I used it anyway, slicing through zombies one by one. I looted the zombies and continued on my way, choosing to fight until my sword broke, at which point I returned to my original plan, walking calmly through the hordes as I made my way towards home. Unfortunately, the day's festivities used up more time than I had hoped, so I decided to stop in one of my safe houses for the night. The next morning, as I was getting ready to head home, I ran into survivor Chris and Dr. Daniel. I invited them both, and Chris Wells joined as Fresh, and Dr. Daniel joined as Fish. I felt Fish needed a doctor's uniform better suited for our times and gave him some gear I had looted earlier. As we walked home, Fish explained to me that he could not offer much to us in the way of fighting, but could serve the community with his medical prowess if we had the facilities for it. I was intrigued by the doctor's proposal, and when we got home began a list of other facilities that might be useful to us. Day 241, I went to work on the seemingly easiest part first, the dining area. I spent the whole day removing walls, sawing logs, and laying down floors, expanding the area off the kitchen until I foolishly destroyed the light switch which apparently permanently turns off the lights. The next morning I had Disco and Danger help me track down some outdoor lighting, and I have to say I was pleasantly surprised with their performance. We spent the day grabbing what lights we needed, and I spent the night installing them on the walls. Day 243, I grabbed the bulldozer and my metalworking gear and spent the day cleaning up the roads. I stopped by the Gigamart on the way home to stock up on food and in the process made two new friends, Moly the Mole and Pancake the Hedgehog. With the main roads now officially open, I could start grabbing more stuff for the base. I had Fresh come with me as we first hit up the clothing store to grab some mannequins. We then headed across the street to the dentist's office to grab medical supplies and furniture. While there, we found a locker in the back that had some nice gear in it. I got a new jacket and pants, and Fresh got a bulletproof vest and a gas mask. I spent the rest of the day building tables and chairs, completing the dining room. I started day 245 by first building a new room on the second floor that I could use as my bedroom. Once that was done, I started moving the furniture we took from the dentist's office into what would be our medical facility. I could tell Dr. Fish wasn't super impressed, but he said he'd make it work. After that, I spent time moving all the metal shelves out of this room. I put some mannequins on the far wall, built a fence, and put down some tables and lights for our shooting range. Day 246, I added more to my to-do list. I wanted to find some gym equipment, get some military lockers, and start trapping and fishing. I knew the gym equipment would be difficult to find, so first I decided to team up with Disco and Danger again to grab some lockers from the police station. I went back to the armory, but realized that they only had the small versions of the military lockers I wanted, so I decided to pass. It wasn't a total waste of time though, since I was able to grab better gear for Danger. Day 247, I was going to work on the armory, but in order to build the lockers I wanted, I needed more hinges. So I went around town grabbing what I could find. In the process, I started to see that with the roads clear and the zombies gone, people were actually starting to move back into the city. I marked where they had set up shop, but otherwise felt like they were doing just fine on their own. Once I had what I needed, I headed home and worked on the armory. Once I was happy with how it turned out, I turned my attention to trapping. Heading out into the forest, setting up some wooden box traps, and marking the location on my map. Now that I had some traps set, I figured I should start working to put some nets out too. It seemed like the easiest move would be to head down the road to check out the bridge. So that's what I did. On my way, I spotted a hostile survivor. I would have dealt with her myself, but it seemed that she was already taking damage. And once she was dead, I saw why. As four other survivors emerged from the tree line. I was grateful these people didn't automatically see me as a threat too, otherwise I might have shared a similar fate. After that, I walked the rest of the way to the bridge, or at least to where the bridge used to be. Bridge or not, this place wasn't crawling in zombies, which was my main criteria for a fishing spot. Satisfied with the areas relative safely, I grabbed the bulldozer and opened the road for business, not realizing until later that I had left all of my fishing gear back at Fort Matthew. 
In hindsight, I actually could have crafted what I needed if I would have realized that the second fishing rod recipe didn't require fishing line. Feeling a little disappointed, I went to check my traps and found that two were broken, two were missing bait, and they were all empty. For some strange reason, I didn't bring any bait with me when I came out to check, so I grabbed the two traps that were empty and left the other two to see if they could catch anything overnight. I went back to check the next morning and we still hadn't caught anything. So I decided to try somewhere else a little farther into the forest. Later, as I was checking my to-do list, I realized that in order to find some of the more specific things I was looking for, I would need to start clearing new areas of town. There was no way of knowing exactly what we'd run into out there, so I once again turned to Disco and Danger for this mission. At the next intersection, we could feel that we were in for a fight. It started slow at first, as it so often does, and we were able to stand our ground as they came in waves. But as we pushed in, it became evident that standing our ground was no longer an option. Danger and I took turns holding a position while the other fell back to reload. Eventually, Disco managed to rejoin us just in time to cover survivor Eileen as she made her escape. The fight didn't officially end for a while after that, but the numbers were far fewer and I knew the other two would watch my back as I scavenged the area. I was proud of our little hit squad. We worked well together, even up against a pretty big horde. I told the guys that I was glad we all made it out since I had lost a lot of friends to a lot less. To which Disco replied that he was glad I trusted him enough to run. Huh. The next morning, the three of us went next door to loot the pharmacy. After that, we once again had a fight at the intersection. We hadn't really made much progress by the afternoon, so I decided it was time to bring out the shotgun. I left the others on guard in the laundromat and went to work. My intention was to draw the zombies towards me while I walked back down the road, but not everyone was interested. Disco ran out the door and tripped, but I got there just in time. I wanted to go with him to make sure he was good, but I remembered what he said the night prior. With that, I continued with the plan and spent the rest of the day clearing zombies. Once it was dark, I headed back to search for the others. I was worried I might have made a mistake when I saw that they hadn't made it back yet, but that feeling soon left when I found them posted up in the pharmacy. Day 251, we were met with a storm. Not wanting to deal with that, I spent the morning swapping weapons before heading over to the pharmacy again to check what was in the back. Not sure what it is about medical areas, but they did not disappoint. Disco got a new mask since he refused to hide his mohawk under a helmet, and Danger got a whole set of clear sky armor. Not knowing how long the storm would last, we decided to head home. Day 252 started while I was still sorting the items we had looted into the base. Not sure what came over me, but for some reason I concluded that 3am was a perfect time to head deep into the forest to check my traps. I'm sure nothing bad will happen. Oh look, something bad happened. I spent about an hour fighting through my nightmare situation before finally checking my stupid traps. I went to bed at 7.30am and woke up at 5.30pm. I sorted inventory for a few hours while I waited for the sleeping pills to kick in to reset my body clock. Day 253, I accomplished three things. Built a crate to store clothes in, cut a path to my traps, and outfitted Dr. Fish and Collar with new gear. Day 254, I wanted to take some of the newer community members out on a run. So once we got geared up, Echo, Fresh, and I headed over to a familiar intersection to continue working on the area. We fought through the day, clearing one street at a time until... By the end of the day, we had successfully cleared the block. The next morning, I worked on cutting a drivable path to the area we had just cleared. I marked my path on the map, then had to rethink some of my map markers. There we go. This area was now accessible by car, which turned out to be great since the helicopter was back. Limited visibility plus a lot of noise was a no-go for me. Even though we had deemed the area quote-unquote safe, the helicopter can really make zombies come out of the woodwork. Not wanting to draw attention to the base, we waited in the walled construction site for things to die down, pretty much wasting the day. That night, as I was looking over my map, I heard gunshots outside. I ran to see what was going on, but it was on the back side of my base, so it took forever for me to get over there. Fortunately, the situation seemed to have resolved itself, but I needed to change that design flaw. So on day 256, I threw up some walls, added a floor and some railing, and we had a tower. I then tied some escape ropes off the side for easy access. 
After that, I decided to step up my trapping game by building and setting some cage traps. And then to briefly summarize what happened next, I went to get a four-wheeler but brought the wrong battery. Day 257 started with a raid, which seemed threatening at first but devolved into just... dumb. Not a lot of ways I can narratively spin this, but I had to include it because I piled their bodies out front and they gave me a bunch of weapons and ammo. I grabbed myself a new rifle and then brought the proper battery to get my four-wheeler. Since I still had time in the day, I tried to walk to a point of interest along the river, but quickly realized that was a bad idea and turned around. Day 258, I once again turned my attention to getting stuff for the base. I figured the dock with a building on it would probably have fishing gear, that was the point of interest I was trying to walk to yesterday, and that the school might have some gym equipment. Checking these buildings would require me to venture through a lot of unexplored territory, but fortunately for me, some dummies recently restocked my ammo supplies. I spent the day doing what I do best. The next morning, I headed towards the school first. I didn't find any gym equipment, but not wanting to waste a trip, I started checking lockers, storage rooms, and ultimately the library for anything useful. I read some books I had been missing from my personal library before making my way towards my second destination. I'm gonna be honest, it seemed bigger on my map, but I walked inside and on the shelf was a screwdriver. Disappointed, I walked back to the safe house I slept in the night before. Day 260, I headed home. I sorted the items I had looted into the base, spent some time tailoring, went out to check my traps, and then, not really having anything better to do, I crafted myself a sword. That night, I took a look at my map and realized while there would always be more work that could be done, we had accomplished a lot here. The next morning, I decided to start things off by testing out my new sword. It was fun, but a little slow. After that, I invited Cobra, Collar, and Fresh to help me work on the fishing dock. I figured Cobra could use a break from management. My intention when coming down here was to build a new dock, but walking over to the broken railroad, I realized the dock was already built. So instead, I spent time chopping trees so I could drive to the water. Day 262, I crafted some fishing nets and went back to the river to set them. With that now done, I had an idea. I wanted to make a small outpost at the gas station on the road to West Point. I thought it would be a nice rest stop for anyone traveling from Riverside, or if I ever wanted to explore Muldraw. In order to set that up, I would first need to grab another generator. So I invited my three best. And on the way, something very unexpected happened. Wait, is that? Holy cow, that's Enigma. It had been over 30 days since my brief interaction with Enigma. He formed up with the rest of us as we cleared the street, but soon he and Disco started to run. Before too long, we were surrounded. I wanted us to stick together, but I had learned that sometimes splitting up was a better option. I decided to run ahead so I could make my way around the block and attack the horde from the side. On my way, Danger managed to catch up with me. Soon after, Cobra made her way to us as well. Then Disco, and finally even Enigma. I was glad the plan worked, but it left me a little too confident. I can't even remember the last time a zombie had actually injured me. I guess this was a friendly reminder that death is only one mistake away. Day 263, we walked back to grab the car, then drove up and grabbed the two generators before heading home. We had to take our time on the way back because we only had four seats in the car, meaning someone had to run. I spent the rest of the evening preparing for our next move. On day 264, I headed out. You know what that means. The next morning, I decided to check out the area. I wanted to see how drivable the road was, plus I would need a bed and some supplies for the outpost. But as I suspected, the road would need some work before I could drive on it. And similarly predictable were the zombies. I finished cleaning up around the time it was getting dark, so I headed back. As I was getting ready to sleep, I saw a survivor walking around the area. I figured if he had been living around here already, he might be interested in helping with the outpost. He agreed and joined as Gator. 
Day 266, I decided to bring in some backup to help me with the outpost. I hotwired a truck that I could exchange for my bus. I loaded up a bunch of supplies and brought Cobra, Disco, Danger, and Enigma with me. But unfortunately, on day 267, I actually had to head back to the base again because I forgot my propane tanks. I made it a little way down the road before stopping to fight. I guess all my driving around had drawn some attention. But I have to say, I wasn't mad about it. Something about this new helmet lit a fire in me. I felt like the predator, and I craved violence. And the universe was accommodating. I honestly had no idea where all of these zombies had been hiding for all this time. I had to fight again as I headed up the road, and it stood to reason that if there were zombies here, there would be zombies around the base. Not wanting to fight in the dark, I decided to sleep in my car and let the fort walls do their job for a night. Day 268, I secured the perimeter around the base, then loaded up a second time for my outpost. I headed out, but then... Oh, I forgot the one of the most important things that I wanted to bring with me. As I reversed back to the base, somehow we were under attack. This time I used my shotgun to do the clearing so I could draw out the zombies that might be hiding. Once it was over, I hooked up the portable generator I had forgotten about up until today and decided to head out in the morning. Day 269, I drove back to the gas station. The others introduced me to a survivor they had met while I was gone, and we gave Barb the call sign Graves. After that, we had some work to do. We had one group chopping trees and gathering logs, another posted on guard, and I went to work salvaging wrecks. Then I started work on construction, and by the end of the day, we had made some good progress. Day 270 was more work on the outpost. I finished the railings and then built some counters before stealing a sink from one of the nearby stores and hooking it up to the rain collectors for water. After that, I started looking through some of the gear I had and decided it was time for Cobra to have some better equipment. She was my oldest friend after all and was the acting leader of our new fort, so it only made sense that she be as heavily outfitted as me. I started the next morning by grabbing a refrigerator for the new outpost, then I headed out to grab a bed. I spent the majority of the day salvaging wrecks and chopping trees so I could drive to the Dixie Mobile Park. I grabbed some supplies and spent the night. Day 272 was the day that changed everything. I wanted to continue scouting out the area before heading back. There were a few other commercial buildings to the north, and I wanted to get a sense of how hard it might be to drive to Moldraw. Almost immediately, I ran into a ton of wrecked cars. Fortunately, however, most of them seemed to be on one side of the road. I went up to the buildings and found a small gas station and a diner before continuing up the road. As I made my way, I checked the bed of a nearby truck, and there it was at last. Fishing gear. Finally, the wait was over. The change I had... Nah, I'm just kidding. <gasps> no way. Oh my gosh. Nothing else matters anymore. This discovery was game changing. Moving forward, distances would be trivial. Roads obsolete. I wouldn't have to worry about wrecks or trees when I could just fly right over them. I was so excited, I was only focused on all of the potential good that it would provide me. But little did I know at the time that my new wings were made of wax, and I have a bad habit of flying close to the sun. I headed back to the outpost to gather what I needed for tomorrow. Day 273, I woke up and took Cobra, Disco, and Danger with me to see what I had found. I wanted them to be with me for the maiden voyage. I installed the charged battery and added the fuel. I put my electrical skills to work, and it spun to life. I stayed close to the road at first as I became acquainted with the controls, but once I was comfortable, I knew what I wanted to do first. I flew over the trees and made my way to the river. Our first flight was a success when we landed outside of Fort Matthew. It was so nice to see everyone again. Hurricane, Lucky, Blackjack, Omen, Fang, Shield, and my boy Ronald, or Survivor. I gave Disco and Danger a tour of Fort Matthew before heading to bed. Day 274, I spent the morning grabbing some supplies for our journey home. 
I spent some time repairing the helicopter and then we were off. But of course, there was something I needed to try on the way back. Oh, this is the best. After that, I decided to see if I could park this thing close enough to the gas station to refuel. And I could. But before we could head back to the main base, we were greeted by some zombies. Which wasn't super surprising due to all the noise. We handled the situation before heading home, leaving Enigma, Gator, and Graves to look after the new outpost. Soon we encountered a problem. As it became dark, it was almost impossible to see, and the only light this thing had was mounted off the right side. I was struggling to land with the limited vision and was making a lot of noise in the process. By the time I finally did land, it was too late. Caller was the first into the fight, but had to retreat when she nearly got overrun. Everyone was fighting together to protect our home, but there was more to come, a lot more. Fortunately, we didn't lose anyone this time. Day 275, we got to work repairing the base. I had everyone piling corpses while I built an extension off our wall for a dedicated landing area. In order to continue construction on day 276, I needed a sledgehammer, which I happened to have left in my Humvee. Given everything that had happened, you would think I would have driven over there, but instead I flew. I spent a good amount of time after that picking off zombies before I could get back to work on the wall. Day 277, I spent the whole day finishing the wall and setting up the landing pad. Day 278, I needed hinges in order to make a gate for the base. I had hinges, but I took them all to the other base, the, the outpost. Day 278 was also the day I decided to stop vaguely referring to the areas I've colonized and give them names. Alongside Fort Matthew, we now also had Fort Bear and Lag Station. Foolishly, I took my helicopter again to head up the road to Lag Station. When I arrived, the crew was already in a tough spot. I tried to save her, but Graves was already gone. After that, I was met with a difficult decision. Do I take the time to land, disabling my weapons, leaving the others to fend for themselves, or do I stay in the air and provide cover for Enigma and Gator? I knew landing would have been the right call, but I once again fell into my old habit of trying to be a hero. After a little while, there was a break in the horde, and I took that as an opportunity to land. But by then, the damage was already done. I did everything I could to get the others out before we got separated. Now it was time to clean up my mess. That night before heading to bed, I thought about what had transpired. To be honest, I'm not sure I could have saved Graves, even if I had chosen to drive. But when Enigma made it back and told me that Gator wasn't coming, I knew that one was on me. Neither of us could sleep much that night, so early the next morning I decided to give Enigma some new gear. Then we went around looting the battlefield, waiting for the sun to rise before flying home. I made sure to fly the same path that I had before to minimize the amount of zombies I draw over to us. It wasn't a guarantee, but it seemed to work this time. After that, I built the metal gates that I needed the hinges for, then buried the people who died over something so small. Day 280, I decided I wanted to upgrade the defenses of Fort Bear to accommodate the coming and going of a helicopter. So I took the pickup truck over to the warehouse, grabbing a fuel trailer on the way. I grabbed a few items for a couple different ideas, filled up the trailer with gas, and made my way back home. I wanted to set up a second barrier around the fort, one that I could either shoot through or over from atop the inner wall. My first thought was sandbags, but once I realized you could just hop over them, I decided against it. My second idea was high metal fences, Kind of like what Fort Matthew has, but more heavy duty. It would definitely be more secure this way, but I'd have to get creative to come up with the resources for this project. Day 281 was the beginning of what felt like my biggest project to date. The first thing I needed to track down was more welding rods. So Collar, Cobra, and I headed over to the warehouses out by Riverside where we managed to pick up four. After that, we headed for Fort Matthew. 
It was weirdly nostalgic flying through the town, seeing remnants of what felt like a past life. We were able to gather three more welding rods from Fort Matthew before heading back to Fort Bear. Day 282, I spent the morning working on the fence until I ran out of supplies. After that, I went around town picking up scraps I had left from salvaging vehicles before heading home to repeat the process. Day 283, I needed more scrap metal and I wanted my Humvee back. Luckily, these things coincided because as it turns out, burnt out wrecks actually give you more scrap metal than functional cars when salvaged. And my Humvee was parked around a lot of burnt out wrecks. I chopped cars all day before heading home. Day 284, more fences and more salvaging. Day 285, I was out of welding rods. So I headed over to the warehouses north of Moldraw, killed a bunch of zombies from the comfort of my pilot seat, then proceeded to pack rat, ending the day with 19 welding rods from three out of the five buildings in the area. Day 286, I built some more fences, then headed to the river where I knew there were more burnt out wrecks. The only reason I'm dragging this day out is because while I was salvaging, I kept getting passed by just a ton of random survivors. So many, in fact, that I started writing their names down to make sure I wasn't going crazy and seeing the same people over and over again. By the time I went home, I had crossed paths with 19 different people. Day 287, more fence building before taking a lap with the bulldozer to clear some space. Once again, I was out of scrap metal and I had already salvaged all the wrecks close by. Well, that's not entirely true. I grabbed Echo, Enigma, and Fresh and headed back to the river. It made sense in my mind that if there were wrecks on my side, there would be wrecks on the other side of the river too. All I needed was a bridge. A thing to note here is that I didn't fill the bridge in all the way to the other side. Day 288, the weather was absolutely ridiculous. I finished the width of the bridge and left all the extra planks I had on the ground to finish the length at some other time. A seemingly sensible conclusion. Then my idiot brain thought of this. All right, this is probably not the smartest thing in the world, but since I have the rest of the day, pretty much, I might as well take out the helicopter and uh, try to clear the other side, scout out how many wrecks there are. So that's what I did. With terrible visibility and hurricane winds, I fueled up my flying machine, grabbing 300 rounds of 5.56 so I could lay waste to the zombies on the other side of the river. I could only see haunting silhouettes through the mist and rain of an undead army starting to form. But what did I care? In this moment, I was untouchable. I was a force of nature like the storm that surrounded me. The sound of my blades was the thunder and my bullets the rain. Their numbers meant nothing to a man who could fly. Until the wax melted. <gasps> oh, oh. So there I was standing in the rain on the other side of an unfinished bridge. With only a few hours of daylight left and my helicopter continuing to attract zombies from all around. Armed with a pistol and a flashlight, what would you have done? Once I got over my initial shock, I started looking through my inventory to see what kind of options I had. Fortunately, I hadn't put away the stuff I used to build the bridge before coming out here, which meant I still had a saw and nails on me. If I could find the stuff to make an axe, I could finish the bridge and get out of here. In order to find what I needed, I had to forage for it, reducing my already limited visibility in a sea of trees. It took me about an hour to find a chip stone, but it took me over three butt-clenching hours to find a tree branch in a freaking forest. As frustrating as that was, it looked like I was gonna make it. I chopped a tree, sawed some planks, and finished the bridge. I then used the planks I had left perfectly out of reach on the other side to build a wall divider. For those curious as to what happened back there, pressing D makes bullets come out of your helicopter. Pressing E makes you come out of your helicopter. Day 289, I had to get my helicopter back. I went to the end of my bridge and started screaming like a madman to draw the zombies over. I guess they didn't realize that the only thing separating us was a single flimsy wall. 
I took out as many as I could from the bridge before venturing over. What a wild turn of events. Especially when you consider how few wrecks there actually were on this side of the river. As I began looting zombies, I found a dude just walking about. If this guy could unabashedly walk into the aftermath of this nonsense, this guy was worth recruiting. Kai agreed to join, and I gave him the call sign Hellion. After we finished looting, I turned my attention to the helicopter. Despite it being sideways, it was still in good shape, so we hopped in and headed home. Day 290, I walked back to the river and grabbed my Humvee. After that, I got Hellion outfitted, and the two of us along with Disco and Danger flew over to the junkyard in Riverside to get more scrap metal. Day 291, we headed back to the trailer park by Lag Station to find more wrecked cars. We of course had to fight off all the zombies a helicopter attracts, but managed to do so with enough time left in the day to salvage some cars and head back to Fort Bear. And on day 292, I finally finished the outer fence. What a process it had been, but I was happy with the result. At least I thought I was, until I saw a zombie while I was installing some lights. I thought, what a perfect opportunity to take advantage of my new security measures. As it turns out, you can't shoot through these fences. You could shoot through the fences at Fort Matthew, that's why we built the wall in the first place. But apparently not these ones. Day 293, we got more wood to continue construction. Day 294, I worked on building these outcroppings from the wall that would allow people to shoot zombies on either side of the fence. Day 295, I spent the morning finishing the add-ons to the wall. It wasn't what I originally envisioned, but I guess the same could be said about this whole mission. After that, I headed over to the bar and snagged a pool table and a pinball machine for the base. I spent the rest of the evening thinking about the future as I repaved the parking lot and put tiles around the farm. I could feel my time here was drawing to a close. But there was one last thing I wanted to do. Day 296, I was heading to the secret military base outside Rosewood. I figured if I was ever going to find the people who had been flying around me for close to a year, this would be the place. But what I found was far worse than I could have possibly imagined. In fact, I can't even show it here. But I'll circle back to this at the end for those interested. Day 297, I wanted to do one last thing for the people of West Point. Armed to the teeth, I walked up and down the streets of the city, taking down every zombie I could find. Was it enough? Who knows. But at least I could take a few hundred more off the table. I spent day 298 hanging around the base, enjoying what we had built, and I watched the sunset sitting on the wall. Day 299, it was time for me to break the news to everybody. I was leaving, and I didn't know if I'd be back. Up until now, I had killed tens of thousands of zombies, hundreds of raiders and hostile survivors, and had 23 friends die under my watch. I was tired. And this city didn't need a butcher anymore. On the morning of day 300, I hopped in my helicopter and flew away.